Yeah, I don't know the mic in the middle of the table, yeah. Alan, can you hear me? Yes, who is it? Alan, just so you know, we can hear your back conversations. If you want to moot, moot, moot your phone, mute it until we uh, until you're ready to speak. That would be helpful. Okay, I've got um, Michael Fairfield and Gail Farron Robinson on this call as well. Okay, just so you know, we can hear the back conversation, okay. background noise. Okay. Well, that Thank you. Sense. Thank you. Okay, I'll call to order a, a joint work session of the Town of Normal and the City of Bloomington. Uh, we'll have a roll call and a pledge of allegiance to the flag. Uh, I will note that I am present. Uh, Councilwoman Reese? Here. Councilman Fritzen? Here. Councilman McCarthy? Here. Councilman Preston? Here. Councilman Scott? Here. Councilwoman Gaines? Here. Uh, Mayor Renner is uh, not here. Uh, Councilman uh, Wildbabe? Here. Sorry about that. Councilman uh, Lauer, or Alderman Lauer? Here. Alderwoman Howman? Here. Alderman Sage? Here. Alderwoman Stearns? Here. Alderwoman Painter? Here. Alderman Fruin? Here. And Alderman Schmidt and Black are not able to join us tonight. We'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag, and I'd ask uh, everyone to remove their hat and, and leave it off for the remainder of the meeting. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, one God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Let me find my agenda here. Uh, we're going to start with an a in, introduction and comments by representatives of Paradigm Bioaviation, uh, Mr. Rob Pizzini. Rob, Thank you, Mayor. Yours. Good. Uh, representing uh, Paradigm this evening, we have George Muller, our attorney, uh, to my right here, and myself, and by telephone from England, where it's just a little bit after midnight, uh, we have Alan Robinson, Michael Fairfield, and Gail Robinson. So they'll, they'll be speaking as, as we go. Uh, we also, uh, let me clarify something that uh, you may have all read in the pantograph recently. It indicated that the current landfill per ton rate was $46.46 compared to the paradigm rate of $49.50 in 2018. Uh, all of that's accurate. But what was missing was the landfill rate in 2018 is scheduled to be 5150. So it, our rate actually is lower and will continue to be lower. And that leads me to the financial benefit projected for Bloomington Normal over the first 10 years to be either $4.5 million or $9.4 million, depending on whether or not transportation cost is absorbed after the landfill is at capacity in 2017. Uh, if the municipal solid waste, which I think we can refer to as garbage in the future, here, uh, the transportation cost to get to Clinton or Pontiac has been estimated between $13.50 and $15. So that, that would be the difference. Uh, in addition to the financial benefits that this project offers, there are benefits such as enhanced reputation for the community for encouraging, quote, green, unquote, reduced carbon emissions, job creation, 
over 100 jobs uh, to build the plant and approximately 100 skilled and semi-skilled jobs once the plant is up and running. We anticipate having a world-class research center in the plant, uh, reduce foreign oil dependency, and this is significant, a, a support of the United States Navy and United States Air Force mandate to get to 50% use of alternative jet fuels by the years 2020 and 2016, respectively. So this is the direction the country is going. The 23-page document the city manager has asked us to prepare uh, indicates that we're not just a startup company with no previous experience. Uh, we've had a management team in place in telecommunications and the aviation fields with success over the past three decades. And our chairman has asked me to mention at this point, uh, there's been publicity about a personal bankruptcy in England uh, several years ago, and he's quite willing to talk to anyone about that, the reasons uh, after the meeting. We don't think this has an effect on this project. This is a commercial project, and in that bankruptcy, there was no one who wasn't paid 100% of what he or she was owed, with the only exception being the uh, company that forced the bankruptcy. So we can talk more about that, but outside of this, uh, this meeting. We believe the 23-page document we gave you should indicate to you that the gasification process that we're going to use compared to incineration should be clear. Uh, incineration is not a clean process. Uh, gasification is a clean process. We have all of the trucks that haul garbage coming into the plant under roof before they unload. And nothing is going to go up in the air. You won't feel like you're in a nearby city where when you go into that city, you know you're there. Uh, nothing is going up in the air. There's no toxic fumes. As far as sites are concerned, a number of people have said, well, where are you going to locate? Well, we've so far looked at six different places. And for one reason or another, none of the six have met all the qualifications that are necessary for us to locate the plant. Uh, I think we spent close to $20,000 on an engineering study for one of them to only discover that the 100 plus acres got down to 13 acres and 13 acres is not enough. So we aren't ready to disclose where we're going to locate because we don't know. But we do have three other sites and once the town of Normal and the city of Bloomington review and approve uh, having their garbage come to us, uh, we will secure a site. We are confident that that won't be a problem. Uh, also, uh, we've signed a letter of intent to secure feedstock beyond what the city and the town would be giving us. Uh, from uh, Tom Kirk, and that, that uh, letter of intent ha has been signed and we will be working toward an agreement uh, with that. We have also, we're in the final stages of a memorandum of understanding with the director uh, at the Illinois Sustainable Research Center at the University of Illinois. And that memorandum effectively says they want to have a research center in our plant occupying somewhere in the area of 20,000 square feet. Uh, they want to use this as a hub for other research uh, that they'll do in the state of Illinois. And one of the interesting parts of that memorandum, when we said after we get this plant up and running, it's replicable and we want to do others like this around the country. And their immediate reaction was, no, you don't want to do that. You want to let us locate plants or cities communities in Illinois where you can do this and we will do the work of locating those cities for you and convincing them how good an idea this is before you even go visit. And we thought, fine, uh, we'd just as soon have them all in Illinois at the beginning. So we're, we're happy to be working with the folks at the University of Illinois. One of the key ingredients for success of this project is cooperation. We want to cooperate with other parties in the community, like Tom Kirk, 
and the University of Illinois and other suppliers and haulers because we think that by cooperating and forming a consortium that we'll be able to benefit everyone more and have more business. We anticipate people wanting to locate around us just like people want to locate around the Mitsubishi plant. The actual ownership of our local facility is being considered by our bond financing people uh, out of New York and Europe. It's a, a bond consortium. Uh, they're encouraging us to do a 501c3 entity for ownership, which will allow us to bring, well, frankly, uh, the city of Bloomington and the town of Normal into the consortium to be part of the ownership. And it isn't something that's unprecedented the town and the city are already owners of CERBEN, uh, the Central Illinois Regional Broadband Network. So that's the type of thing that we're trying to do to bring the whole community in. I know there's a World Series game on tonight, so I'm going to stop talking so we can answer questions and, and go as long as you'd like or as short as you'd like. Uh, uh, Alan, is there anything you would like to add before we take questions uh, from the councils? No, I think that sort of covers the ground. Obviously, we've uh, obviously we have been working on this in Bloomington for almost three years. We have a teaming um, partnership with an EPC contractor with Southern Research in North Carolina. Um, ISU is involved in it. We have made presentations before the council in 2011 and 2012. Um, you know, we are now reaching the point of moving to the host agreement, which is common before going into a siting ordinance. Um, and the waste disposal and supply agreement are conditional on this plant being constructed and us meeting the criteria that will be laid down within the siting ordinance. So uh, whilst we want to see the supply of MSW come from the cities into this plant, they are not binding themselves into a project uh, unless the project actually takes place. Um, you know, there is a whole process yet to go through uh, a, a long, longish period of um, public inquiry. That will be in another three or four months' time as we move into a siting ordinance. And at that time, I'm, all of the issues of road transportation, um, emissions, the design of the plant, the renderings of you know the scale of it, the uh, safety aspects of it, all of those issues will be covered in a public inquiry. So um, I think we just need to be clear that what is going on today is basically the host agreement, which is a precursor <coughs> to any um, siting application for a transfer station or for a landfill, and a conditional agreement that if we build the plant that the city has an, uh, a benefit rate by which it can bring and dispose of its current MSW that is going to a landfill and would need to find a new home once the landfill closes uh, in 2016, 2017, whenever the landfill now does ultimately close. So I think that's the background to this meeting. Um, and we're here to answer questions. It's been a long process of negotiation to reach draft agreements, which are now the subject of this meeting. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Rob, I'm going to uh, uh, let staff do their uh, presentation uh, Thank you. as well, and then we'll open it up to questions from the council. Yeah, we're going to need those two seats, but you can come back to the table when we go to general discussion. Okay. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for your attendance. For those who don't know me, my name is Mark Peterson. I'm the city manager of Normal. And to my right is Brian Day, who's Normal's Corporation Council. And uh, Brian will be doing most of the talking, but I'd like to just make some introductory comments. Um, as, uh, as Alan Robinson indicated on the uh, speaker, he's uh, on the phone, um, we have been having conversations off and on with representatives of Paradigm Bioaviation for nearly three years. However, we've been working uh, much more intensely, I would suggest, over the past six months uh, as this project uh, has uh, moved forward. 
Um, there are a variety of regulatory matters involving this type of facility, typically referred to under Illinois law as a pollution control facility. Uh, any sort of a transfer station, a landfill, or a solid waste conversion facility such as being proposed is generically referred to as a pollution control facility and there are a variety of uh, uh, regulations under the uh, promulgated by the Illinois EPA that uh, must be followed. So we felt, and, and again I appreciate your attendance this evening uh, in talking with my colleague uh, with the City of Bloomington, David Hales, and, and ultimately uh, Mayors Coos and Renner, we felt that this joint work session would be uh, useful given the complexity of this uh, initiative and the complexity of the agreements involved. Uh, if indeed these come before you and you're asked to uh, formally consider the agreements, uh, we felt it was important to get everybody in the same room so you're all hearing the same questions and the same answers at the same time. So that's the purpose of this work session. Um, in anticipation of a, a formal proposal being submitted by Paradigm Bioaviation for this facility, and we're talking, as, as Rob mentioned, a waste conversion facility that purportedly will consume or will accept a significant portion of the solid waste stream from the two communities, Bloomington and Normal, as well as other sources. And this is material that's primarily being, currently being deposited in the McLean County landfill. Uh, as proposed, this facility would accept that material and through uh, a technological process that I'm not necessarily prepared to fully explain, would transform that into a marketable commodity such as jet fuel or electricity with uh, apparently no uh, adverse environmental impact. So uh, anticipating um, a, a proposal to site such a facility within the corporate limits of normal, and I did note that uh, Mr. Fazzini indicated that there are multiple sites under consideration, but we, we understand that most of those, at least maybe the leading candidate, is within the corporate limits of normal. Um, we uh, recommend to the council, staff recommend to our council, uh, that a pollution control facility siting ordinance be adopted that sets forth a very detailed process in, in accordance with state law as to how uh, the, such a facility would be approved with a substantial public input. That ordinance was uh, adopted by the Normal Town Council back in July. And since that time, uh, staff in normal, principally Mr. Day and myself, have been working closely with representatives of Paradigm Bioaviation negotiating two very important agreements, uh, drafts of which were distributed to all of you, uh, should be in your, your council dais, along with a memorandum from Mr. Day that was drafted to the normal council giving um, sort of an overview of the more important provisions of both of those agreements. Um, but in a minute, Brian is going to kind of give you some of the highlights, summarize a few of the what we consider the most important agreements. Uh, I, as I said, there are two agreements. One is a host agreement. That agreement would be considered uh, by, the, uh, by the elected body uh, in which the facility is ultimately located. So uh, in anticipation of that facility being located within the, the corporate limits of normal at this point, and that could change, um, that agreement would be um, considered only by the town of Normal and that's accordance with state law. But certainly um, our council wanted to make it uh, transparent and they certainly would welcome input from uh, their colleagues in the city of Bloomington on any aspect of that host agreement. I will also point out, uh, I think as Mr. Day did in his memo, the, the site that we have been led to believe is the leading candidate, although not necessarily the final site, is located in the western portion of Normal uh, within an area that is designated as the Bloomington Normal Metro Zone. And within the Metro Zone, as you probably know, uh, the cities share uh, a variety of expenses and we also share revenue. So uh, we have concluded, and, and uh, David uh, and, and Jeff Jurgens agree, that uh, any fees that Normal receives 
uh, from this host agreement would be shared equally uh, on an ongoing basis with the City of Bloomington. So even though Bloomington isn't an official party of the agreement, uh, the City of Bloomington is certainly a beneficiary and therefore has a, a significant um, interest in that agreement. And again, we would welcome your input. The second agreement is uh, a waste supply agreement. And that is, even though I think the document that was handed out before you has the City of Bloomington on it, um, the Town of Normal has negotiated an identical agreement. Those are identical documents. And those agreements would be uh, ultimately have to be considered by both councils. Um, uh, again, I've asked Brian to start by giving a little overview of the host agreement. Um, and then uh, we'll move into the waste supply agreement. And for that discussion, I'll ask uh, David Hales and Jeff Jurgens to join us uh, at the witness table as they both were highly involved in negotiating um, the agreement that, that is presented to you this evening. Um, I will say that there are, in, you know, I think in the, in the waste supply agreement, there's still a couple of minor provisions that are still open that we have to resolve. I think they can be resolved, but um, it's not final, final. Um, so, um, but I think we're at a point where we can share that information. So I'll turn it over to Brian to make some comments. Thank you. Yeah, as Mark said, we've got uh, two agreements under consideration, the host agreement and the waste supply and disposal agreement. I'd like to start by actually uh, putting these into a, uh, the larger context of where they fit in in the siting process because it's somewhat counterintuitive that we're talking about these now before we're actually talking about whether or not they're actually going to be permitted to operate. Um, the siting process is controlled under the Environmental Protection Act. As Mark mentioned, we've got the process that we put in place for local siting approval. Um, under that provision, Paradigm will have to file an application for local siting. There will be a number of different notifications that go out to the public and other various parties. Um, after all of the notices, there's a public hearing uh, with a hearing officer presiding who will then make recommendations to uh, the normal council who will then ultimately decide whether or not Paradigm meets the qualifications or the criteria that are set out underneath the uh, Environmental Protection Act to determine whether or not they uh, meet the siting criteria. Under those provisions, actually under the statute, it actually says that the host agreement comes before the siting process. It's a little odd. Um, the host agreement will actually become part of the record of the siting process. Um, and then we're also talking about the waste supply and disposal agreement just so that Paradigm knows that this is a commercially viable uh, prospect before the, they go through the expense of what the siting process will be. I'm pointing this out because I want to emphasize, underline, put in bold, and highlight the fact that we're discussing these provisions now in no way says that we have predetermined whether or not Paradigm is going to qualify under the siting process. Uh, we have to, under the statute, talk about these now, but just because we are entering into these agreements, or discussing these agreements now does not mean that we've guaranteed that whenever they file their application for siting that we've decided <coughs> that that's going to be some type of pre-approval. Um, this is just a step in an ongoing process, and we haven't made any determinations as to whether they'll qualify for a local siting. All right, so let's talk about the host agreement. Um, Mark mentioned this will probably be, uh, depending on siting, but it'll be between the town of Normal and Paradigm, um, and obviously with the input from Bloomington, as Mark mentioned. The general purpose of the host agreement is it goes through the regulations and duties of or the relationship between the town and Paradigm after the siting is approved. So they'll go through the siting, they'll have to prove that they're qualified to do business or qualified to operate the particular facility. There'll be some conditions that come out of that. But the host agreement is to provide sort of ongoing regulation, make sure that um, paradigm is operating in the best interest of the community and that's the purpose primary purpose of the host agreement the one you have before you is really a fairly rigorous 
host agreement compared to many around the state. Um, in preparing this document, we pulled host agreements from other pollution control facilities in Illinois, and our provisions are fairly stringent compared to a number of other communities around the state. Um, walk through some of the general terms that are in the host agreement just to discuss what's going to be in there. Um, for the most part, it's um, Article 3 goes over the general, and that's probably the meat of the agreement. These are the general obligations that Paradigm will have. Um, first, and obviously, they'll have to obey all of the laws, rules, and regulations and the provisions of the host agreement and any conditions that come out of the local siting process. Uh, they may not accept or keep hazardous waste on the property. Um, it regulates the hours when they can accept waste, when dump trucks will be delivering waste to the facility. It's um, regular business hours, Monday through Friday, and then half days on Saturday. It caps the amount of waste that they can accept to 1,000 tons per day. That's on an annual uh, average basis. Um, it gives the town access to the facility so the town can make inspections to determine whether Paradigm is meeting its requirements following the law and following the terms of the agreement. Um, that's all we have, all the town has to do is provide some advance notice to the facility. Uh, this is a fairly uh, important provision that we put in. We require Paradigm to post a security bond or some other uh, security in the amount of $2.5 million. Um, this is to ensure that if Paradigm ceases business, there's proper uh, closure of the facility, they don't leave a polluted site, or if they leave, that there's some ability to, um, you know, if they haven't fulfilled their insurance obligations or their indemnification obligations. Um, Paradigm is a, right now they're Paradigm Bioaviation is a limited liability company out of Delaware, which is, I believe, a wholly owned subsidiary, we've been told, from the, uh, of a company in England. Our concern was, has always been that they are essentially judgment-proof. The only assets that this company will have, at least that we could attach, would be this particular facility. And so if they haven't fulfilled their obligations to the town, there may not be ways to recover. Um, you know, if they file for bankruptcy, there may be a line of other creditors ahead of the town. So we wanted to ensure that there is some financial uh, security before we entered into this agreement. Uh, there are uh, insurance provisions, a um, million dollars commercial liability per occurrence, three million for all occurrences. Uh, they got excess liability insurance requirements of three million dollars environmental impairment of two million dollars per occurrence and five million dollars a combined limit on all of those policies the town would be a additional insured on each of those policies um, there are a number of provisions in the host agreement requiring them to keep the um, to prevent dust litter noise other types of uh, issues that would or harm the public health they have to do litter patrol, they have to uh, keep dust down, they have to keep all of their operations inside the building. Um, it requires them to establish a system where they investigate citizen complaints. They have to have a hotline where citizens can call if they have any complaints and investigate those complaints within 24 working hours. And let's see, there's also indemnification provisions. They indemnify the town, its agents, and employees on any of their operations of the facility. Uh, there is a host fee. This host fee is based upon either the tonnage or a minimum. It's on a quarter, $40,000 per quarter is the minimum host fee that Paradigm would pay to the town to help assist in the uh, the regulation that the town will do on the facility, or it's a dollar forty per ton on a um, daily average quarterly basis. Uh, 
the town's obligations are, one of the town's obligations will be to negotiate in good faith the waste supply and disposal agreement, which we're going to talk about after this. And there is also an obligation to negotiate a, an electricity purchase contract. That is still up in the air. Uh, we don't quite know the details of how that's going to work and we're unsure really of what that obligation may ultimately entail. One of the provisions we're looking at, or one of the provisions that's included is a restriction on assignments. Paradigm cannot assign their rights under the contract or transfer controlling ownership in their parent companies without approval from the town council. Um, when they make a request for an assignment, the town has 60 days to decide whether or not to grant that request. Um, there's a reasonableness provision. We can't unreasonably withhold permission to make that assignment or transfer. Um, those are the big ticket issues with the host agreement. Wanna Why don't we, uh, can, is it all right if we proceed with the waste supply agreement overview, Mayor, uh, for that if, if uh, David Hales and, and Jeff Jurgens with the City of Bloomington would like to come up, uh, I'll let Brian continue to, to provide the overview, but I, I'm sure that David and Jeff will uh, have comments. This, of course, is the agreement that irrespective of uh, where the facility is located, uh, both uh, councils would be asked ultimately to uh, consider uh, the waste supply agreement. So, uh, Brian, you want to just jump in and then absolutely uh, see how that goes. All right. Yeah. As Mark mentioned, uh, the version you have has the City of Bloomington. Um, there will also be a similar version, the town. Um, there'll be identical agreements. Uh, basically, this agreement covers two fundamental concepts. Uh, first is that uh, the city will supply Paradigm, or city, town, both of them, will supply Paradigm with all of our municipal solid waste and uh, pay a tipping fee for that. Uh, mun municipal solid waste is what we have, um, it's everything that's other than hazardous waste and does not include recyclable materials that are separately collected. Those will be separate. There's no duty to deliver those to Paradigm. And it also does not include brush, uh, which currently at least the town takes care of on its own and doesn't pay for uh, pay any tipping fees for those disposals. So that's the first part is the obligation of both the town and the city to supply Paradigm exclusively with the municipal solid waste. Uh, the second big component is Paradigm agrees to take all of the acceptable waste that the town delivers, or the city, obviously. Um, so those are the two competing perversions. We have to give them our municipal solid waste. They have to accept, contingent upon the tipping fees, all of the acceptable waste, which is everything other than a, the list of hazardous waste and other medical waste things that are um, defined under the Environmental Protection Act as hazardous. The term of this is 20 years. Um, this is a 20-year agreement. It's actually a, a little longer than a 20-year agreement because it would become effective when it's signed and then after uh, the operation date, that's the date in which Paradigm actually begins accepting the waste. It would continue from 20 years after that point. There's a reopener in the provision for um, uh, based upon the costs of uh, the tipping fees, what we, what we would pay Paradigm for these. The reopener occurs on each five year, five, 10, and 15 year anniversaries of the operation date, and it's based on we can reopen it if there's a if Paradigm is offering a comparable lower a rate, comparable rate to a uh, customer that's lower than us. So it's in, it's, this is so an open position I think that we have, we haven't, uh, I think this is still subject to some negotiation as to what a comparable rate is, how this reopener would work. And I think that's an issue that probably needs some further discussion. Um, as Rob mentioned earlier, the price 
Um, the price is based on our current Republic contract uh, for our current landfill. Um, mentioned the, uh, the amount that is in the 2018. Um, and again, the Republic, it starts in 2018. We've got a half year um, price for 2018. It goes up mid-year. But basically, it's um, either 1% to 4% lower than what we're currently paying the Republic contract. And then as the Republic contract goes, it increases. Um, Republic, it, Republic, it goes to 2021 optional. Our Republic contract expires at the end of 2016 with optional one-year renewals. Um, uh, this would go obviously past that. Right now, Republic's price increases are basically 3% per year on the paradigms. Their starting price, they basically go up every five years in increments, increased 15% per year. Let me just uh, a couple uh, items of uh, emphasis. Uh, <laughs> I just want to make it clear, and, and, and Mr. Day mentioned this. Uh, the agreement, the, the waste supply agreement does not include uh, recyclable materials, meaning those materials that have been deposited into a recycle container that are currently being diverted elsewhere. That would continue um, to, to be dealt with as, as we currently do, or there obviously may be changes in the future. But so in normal, that would, uh, that we would be talking about the, um, the large uh, containers that are located around the community where people can deposit recyclable materials as well as the individual um, containers that, uh, that uh, it residential uh, recycle materials is collected. That would not be diverted, that, in, that material would not be diverted to the Paradigm facility. <coughs> uh, second of all, uh, 20 years is an extraordinarily long agreement for waste supply. It's ordinarily not something that we would feel comfortable with, and frankly, we're not excited about a 20-year agreement. Uh, but that was one of the uh, sort of mandatory provisions that uh, the Paradigm representatives insisted upon, and, and it is due to their ability to secure financing. They felt that they have to be able to um, rely on a long-term waste stream commitment. Obviously, this is the the material that operates the facility without the waste stream, uh, they cannot produce jet fuel or electricity. So in order for them to secure financing necessary to build the facility, they were insisted upon a 20-year uh, stream. Again, it's not something we would ordinarily recommend, um, but uh, that was, a, it, 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 that was a, a, a sort of a deal breaker, if you will, from the perspective of Paradigm Bioaviation. Uh, and I'll mention that a little bit later. The, the, the rates that are uh, included in represent a modest savings uh, to uh, the two municipalities over what we're currently paying. Not a huge savings, but a modest savings. Um, and I will point out that there's a different rate for landscape waste and scrap tires. There's a different uh, tipping fee rate for those uh, products. Again, that's a, a smaller part of our waste stream. Most of the uh, waste we're talking about is in category one, which is called municipal solid waste. That includes bulky waste and everything else that goes to the landfill. And that's the majority of our waste stream. It also provides for, uh, they will accept brush if we choose to deliver brush to them. Uh, we pay for that and in the case of normal, we currently uh, 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 process our own brush and uh, we use that in our parks department and we make that available to other organizations. And so we would likely not be diverting our brush uh, waste stream to this facility. So we're primarily focusing on the municipal solid waste or the garbage that goes to the landfill. I don't know if Jeff or David, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, let me first, uh, Jeff, is there anything else on the agreement? I'd, I'll make a few comments. I just want to make sure if there's anything else you would like to highlight. Uh, are, are you done, Brian? Well, yeah, there, there's a few, uh, there's a couple of benchmarks in there where Paradigm has to meet certain criteria before this would go into effect. Um, they have to have their siting approval by July of 2017. They have to begin construction by August of 2017. They have to be substantially completed. <coughs> 
and uh, start receiving waste from the uh, town and city by August of 2018 or else this agreement would not go into effect and we'd have no obligations. There's also a nether security provision in this. Um, they have to post a bond or letter of credit in the amount of $175,000. The purpose of this is to ensure that if they stop doing business at some point before uh, this agreement has run its course, and we've got to scramble to find some other t some other contract to take our waste. But this would cover any differential between what we're paying Paradigm and any uh, additional contractor that we'd have to find. So, all right, any uh, just also for the uh, city of Bloomington, there's a provision in here that says the mere passage of this uh, does not require the city to support the the uh, local siting process. Um, the city, as uh, Mr. Peterson said, will have a seat at the table during that process, although the city will not have a vote. And um, if, if this were to come before the city of Bloomington and be approved by the city of Bloomington, you're not necessarily saying that you're going to support that process. I'm David Hales, the Bloomington city manager. I'd like to just make a few general comments uh, about what we're discussing tonight. Uh, I think it's important to note that uh, uh, recently it was reported that there's over 600 companies in the United States that are in the business of some means of utilizing technology to convert municipal solid waste to energy. In fact, during the uh, mid to late 80s, I was a city administrator in Centerville, Utah, and our particular county felt that a crisis was coming. Our landfill was uh, going to be closed, it reached capacity, and we need to find some alternative. Uh, through some studies, it was recommended that we build an incinerator, very similar to uh, what Europe has many of these to, to uh, get rid of their waste. Uh, it just so happened, though, because the high cost of incinerator, uh, we entered into some long-term agreements and we went from a landfill tipping fee of about $8 a ton to about $50 to $60 a ton. Well, then over the years, not only did the uh, landfill crisis evaporate, uh, but also because we generated steam, which was sold to an adjacent U.S. military facility, uh, we also, all the projections were that natural gas prices would stay high. Well, they did not. As they dropped, less revenue came in, and the cities that were part of that special service district saw our tipping feeds go up to compensate for the loss of revenue for the energy being uh, generated. Yet all around us, people who were not in this district continued to pay landfill tipping fees of about 10 to $12 a ton. I, I think the lesson we learned, certainly back in the 80s, is you have to be you have to have a, a healthy dose of skepticism. Uh, you know, in, in, uh, to complement Paradigm Bioaviation, they are entrepreneurs. Uh, they are trying to break through uh, and to identify new technology processes to not just turn solid waste into electricity, uh, but to also turn that into a very profitable byproduct, uh, jet fuel which has a potential for some very significant uh, revenue to come into the company. Uh, and I, I say that because as we look long term, uh, in today's climate, more than any other, these emerging technologies of converting municipal solid waste into some sort of ener energy, there's a lot of money being spent. In fact, the major waste management companies throughout the United States are spending uh, millions and millions of dollars to try and see what can they do to solve a problem we all have. I think in doing that, we need to be very cautious. As Mark indicated, a 20-year term is very long term. As indicated, although uh, we have talked about having some flexibility so that we're not locked in necessarily to paradigm for that whole length of time, what we do anticipate, or, or we can't ignore, there could be, with any new technology breakthrough, there can be an increase in competition. So five, ten years from now, 
who knows how many companies might be able to generate a similar uh, process to even generate jet fuel. And these other companies and vendors could very well offer to cities like Normal and Bloomington much more attractive rates for that municipal solid waste. It's very much recommended that as municipalities, we often see the disposal of municipal waste as a burden, a challenge, but I think in this day and age, we need to look at the municipal solid waste as a resource. And as we look at that as a resource, we have to be very, very careful of whether or not we want to give up the flexibility uh, for the future as technology changes. Uh, I do want to recognize that if Paradigm Bioaviation is, is successful and be able to go from municipal solid waste to electricity to jet fuel, that very well could be a game changer. But just like we, uh, a few years ago, who would have imagined <clears throat> that the United States would have gone from a net importer of oil to a net exporter? So once again, in our day and age, technology is changing faster than ever before. And consequently, when you look at long-term agreements, we have to be very cautious, we have to be very conservative, because just like I saw in Utah, what everyone thought in the mid-80s was this wonderful idea, and it was a great investment into new technology, actually turned out to something where elected officials were heavily and strongly criticized for locking into a situation that ultimately, for all our particular citizens and businesses in Davis County, became a tremendous cost burden uh, because the projections and everything people thought would happen didn't become the reality. Um, I also want to uh, just point out as we uh, look at the terms of this agreement, Another recommendation we have talked about but is not in the agreements at this point in time is to have milestones. Milestones so that if Paradigm Bioaviation does not achieve certain progress, that there should be some consequences. In many uh, 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 agreements like this around the nation, we're seeing there's penalties attached. And if there's egregious uh, either non-compliance with those milestones or deliverables, the municipalities have the option and the ability to terminate the agreement. So that's, uh, again, as we talked about, uh, as we look at an agreement such as the waste supply agreement, uh, these agreements need to be fair for both parties. They have to protect, especially our citizens, our ratepayers, people who rely on us to be more conservative than, say, an entrepreneur who is taking high risk, but they're also gambling that they will have that breakthrough, game-changing technology. And it is because of entrepreneurs like that we have seen some tremendous advancement, you know, in our, in our uh, quality of life and, and in many of the innovations. But government is not necessarily, uh, I think, viewed by many should be in that business of, of taking great risks that also can lead to great losses or lock us in over the long term that we may look back in the years ahead as being very, uh, uh, not being uh, nearsighted enough and not trying to protect our citizens over the long term. So those are just a few comments I'd like to share at this point in time as we've been looking at this and as indicated while we've tried to incorporate additional terms to get added flexibility, to, ad to add additional uh, provisions, these have not been agreed upon by the other party. So I think what we are at at this point in time is an agreement that Paradigm Bioaviation is indicating this is as far as we're willing to go at this point in time. Uh, but it's not necessarily what uh, Jeff and I would consider the best agreement, the most fair, and especially one that would protect uh, our cities uh, because of the uncertainty of how emerging technologies could change the, uh, uh, the uh, industry and how municipal waste could become an even greater valuable resource at some point in the future. Thank you.
Thank you, David. I'd just like to add a couple of comments as well, and many of them will, will dovetail nicely with uh, his remarks. Um, I, I will say that um, I think the, the agreements before you are responsible agreements. I'll, I'll credit uh, both Brian and Jeff uh, for doing an excellent job in, in, in negotiating some of the, the more complex uh, terms. Um, and I think, I think that the agreements, and, and I also credit uh, Paradigm Bioaviation for coming to the table in good faith and, and uh, we worked through some very duff, difficult situations and, and generally came to, to agreement. But I will say, uh, as David did, the, the, the agreements are far from perfect. Uh, but we would not even submit an agreement to you that we felt was irresponsible or put uh, the, the, the community at significant risk. I think the host agreement is, as Brian said, a pretty robust agreement, probably better than most host agreements that you will find around the country and certainly in Illinois. Um, and the waste supply agreement, um, although the term is troubling, and I'll talk more about that, um, I think it does uh, incorporate some, some uh, uh, protections that do make me just a little more comfortable with such a long-term agreement. Um, but I will say, uh, in, in, you know, if, if, you, if you choose to go forward and formally consider these agreements, uh, there may be some additional tweaking, but I think they're responsible ones. I will say uh, staff has some pretty serious concerns about this initiative, um, and I'll start with the 20-year waste supply agreement. As David said, technology is changing very rapidly. 20 years is a long time. I don't doubt the, the, the uh, insistence of Paradigm in needing a 20-year commitment for their financing. That sounds logical. I think most uh, lenders, uh, as conservative as lenders are today, are probably going to want that security. Uh, whether it's in our best interest to provide a 20-year commitment, I'm not so sure. Uh, 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 there certainly is a modest savings in this agreement in, uh, over what we're currently paying to our current waste disposal providers. Uh, but of course, we have not gone to our current providers or other providers asking them for pricing for a long-term agreement. It is certainly possible if we did, they would give us a much better deal. Um, and I think that's something that we need to consider. Uh, and, and again, the technology is compelling. Uh, the ability to take our our residential solid waste, our garbage, and turn it into a marketable commodity with no environmental impact and no uh, new landfill development is compelling. Uh, but it is true, and just have done just a little bit of research, this technology is emerging and it's exploding. And although we are not aware of any facility in the United States that is employing that technology in the way that is being proposed here, um, it clearly is uh, something that I think we'll be reading more about in the coming years. And I think we'll be, um, particularly as larger companies, well-financed companies in the, in the field of solid waste uh, handling get involved, I think this is going to become a, 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 real, a real option for communities that um, will, will be beneficial not only financially but environmentally. So I'm here to tell you that from our staff's perspective, uh, we are troubled by the 20-year term, and, and that's something that we would not generally recommend. Um, I will also just be very candid and tell you that um, the current Paradigm Bioaviation team does not have a track record in this area. Um, and this is new technology. It's emerging technology. I think it's a real technology, but it still is emerging. Um, and and uh, you know, certainly with all due respect to Rob Fazzini, uh, who I think is, is here in good faith, uh, he and the members of the team really have no background in solid waste management. Uh, they certainly have never operated a plant like this, nor have they constructed one. That gives us as staff cause for concern. Do they have the ability to pull this off? Um, I'm not so sure, and, and I question that, and I'm not sure we should enter into this type of an agreement with this new complex technology with a group that has virtually zero track record in this regard, and that's something that you all have to consider. I will also point out, to the, particularly to the normal council, if indeed 
this facility is proposed to be located in our community. Once these two agreements are approved, that sets forth a, a process, a lengthy, arduous, complex, contentious siting process. They are not pretty. I've seen them and this one would be no different. And so I would say that you have to go in without, with, in good faith, with, open, with a, an open mind, um, but a willingness to consider this, uh, this particular proposal uh, because uh, you will spend countless hours dealing with this. Uh, there will be likely a protracted uh, hearing process that will generate intense attention. There will be expert witnesses coming from every point of view presented. There will be acrimonious testimony. There will be conflicting points of view. And at the end of the day, you get to make the decision. And it will not be an easy one. So I just share that with you. Go in eyes wide open. If this is something you're interested in pursuing, uh, you will live with this for quite some time because the siting process is very, very involved and um, will occupy a lot of your time in the coming months and possibly years. Not to mention the staff time that's going to be involved, but we're, we've got nothing better to do, so we're certainly willing to commit the staff time that's necessary if this is uh, a direction you want to proceed. Um, I think with that, unless Jeff or Brian have any further comments, we'll uh, conclude our presentation and be available for questions and certainly uh, give you the opportunity to discuss this matter. At this point, I think we can open this up to uh, council's comments, uh, um, concerns, questions. Um, anybody want to take a stab at this first? I have Lord a question. Um, you're going to produce jet fuel. Mm -hmm. It has to be approved by ASTM International, the whole process for the production of jet fuel. And I just wondered, how far along are you in getting their approval. Is that a question for us, or who is the question to? That, that's for you, Alan. <laughs> All yeah, the, the tough questions the ASTM, are for you. <laughs> the ASTM standards were, um, for this type of uh, jet fuel D7466 was, um, uh, was passed in 2009 by a body in Washington called CAFI, which is the Commercial Alternative Aviation Fuel Initiative, mm -hmm. which was um, a body comprising the FAA, NASA, the engine manufacturers, um, and um, ATA, the, Air, the Airline Transport Association. So a, a series of um, additions to that uh, initial new ASTM standard um, have been for different types of production, whether it be from alcohol or from uh, brown oil, from brown greases. Um, so there's now about four different pathways to end up with a certified fuel, which is then compatible with mixing with standard petroleum-based, fossil-based uh, jet fuel. So once it goes into an aircraft, it doesn't matter whether it's synthetically uh, produced or uh, fossil fuel produced from a standard refinery, they are compatible and they mix. And so the production of this fuel all has to be to that ASTM standard. And had that not happened in 2009, that was really the, the starting point of this industry. Did that answer your question? Well, not exactly. Um, I Have you engaged with uh, CAAFI at all to help grease your path to becoming a marketable product? Because right now it's not approved to be a marketable product. I'm sorry, it is, and it is being used in commercial airlines today. I don't think it is. Um, no. no, it's not. <laughs> it's being sorry, tested it with the Air, Air Force, I believe. But um, No, it is being used in commercial airlines as well. In the United States? It's being used for commercial flights. Yeah, Alan, in the United States? In the United States, Alaska Airways, uh, United, 
Uh, United has just uh, invested in building a refinery with um, Altair in California. Um, there are regular flights taking place with uh, this ASTM approved fuel. Well, I'm shocked because I asked the FAA about that and that's not what they said. <laughs> so anyway, I'll have to look into this further. Okay. Johnny, I just, I just want to caution you. Dealing with the FAA, it depends on who you talk to. A lot of times you get a lot of different answers sometimes. <laughs> I've got a long history with that. Um, I'm not, as well, I'm not very, um, I guess I'm impressed with the process and intrigued, but um, really when, it, when, it's de when you're dealing with jet fuel, um, it's, it's really nothing that impressive. It's just kerosene, a high grade. Um, it's really the care and, 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 uh, and maintenance of, of the, the jet fuel that really matters um, in my um, meager um, history. I think I've got about 20 some odd years handling it uh, directly. Um, so, you know, from that standpoint, I'm sure that, you know, it, that can be, you know, that can be done. But uh, um, I think really to the point here is who owns the patent, the U.S. patent, and what is the number? And, and where did you come by this technology? I, I'm, I guess that's more the point here. Um, the patent on the process to produce it? Is that what you're well, asking? On, yes, on the product, on, on, on you know, taking care of the refuse and, and, and developing the technology and, and actually uh, uh, developing something useful out of something that's not. The Technology, and the particular technology we're talking about, is a fissure trough based technology that is used in refineries today. Different types of catalysts will produce a different range of uh, fuels, and producing uh, a fuel, a jet fuel from syngas, is not new. It's been going on since 1930 and pretty much all of the aviation fuel that has come out of South Africa since the early 1970s has been produced in this way. Um, so it's not an individual patent on it, it is a fissure trove type of process and the patent lies, if you like, in the catalyst and the pressures at which you, um, you operate the fissure trove part of the, um, of the process. Um, in particular, we are dealing with Southern Research, um, who have particular catalysts coming um, uh, through, um, I'm trying to think, Chevron is their basic catalyst provider. But there are a number of different catalyst providers that will get you to the standard. The standard, um, the, the ASTM standard that we're talking about, is how the molecules are combined and the um, freezing temperatures, the flash point, um, all of the different components that you measure a fuel by, that is the um, that was the issue for creating the synthetic standard. And the other part of it was the amount of aromatics that are in it. Um, if you're going to mix with conventional jet fuel, I mean, we can talk about numbers, but I don't think the audience probably wants to know the percentages of arom aromatics of today. Um, but that has been the issue was if you're going to have a synthetic fuel which has a limited amount of aromatics, then you know what is the ratio that you could mix it that would still have enough aromatics to keep the seals in the engine swelled and the engine to perform. Um, and that's where a lot of the testing has gone on too. In both um, airlines, pretty much all the airlines are now uh, run commercial flights and some of them are running daily or weekly flights on synthetic jet fuel. Um, so it's not a particular pattern per se, it is a standard to which you produce it using catalysts and techniques that have been around for a long time. It is more about scaling it down in size and the capital cost of the equipment. And that's been a, an issue of polymers, surface areas, um, microchannel, fissure trope processes. You know, it just hasn't been a need to scale this down to a smaller size. The refineries deal on much larger volumes than we're talking about with the amount of feedstock that is available in regional plants. Well, that being said, sir, um, I'm still troubled by the fact that you're, you're delving into something that you have not proven yet. 
you have not actually produced anything and uh, you know you're, you're open you're open to uh, being sued by anybody else that uh, might have a patent on this process um, so you know just from a legal standpoint alone I I think you're really sticking your neck out there and I'm not sure we want to uh, uh, be along as a partner um, just from that standpoint we're alone not, we're, we're not technology producers we're using other people's technology and, and that's, no, and that's the point, and that is right, and yes, sir, that is right at the point. You're using somebody else's technology and maybe without permission, and that's what I'm trying to establish. Not at all. This is not a fly-by-night. Don't spend the money we spend to do this, and we've been doing this for years. You know, we are talking about processes that you put and buy as a complete package, EPC wrapped, with all of the permissions of the owners of the technology. And, you know, that just alone, the technology has been five years in trial in Southern Research in uh, Durham, North Carolina. And that is now the DOD has just approved 210 million of grant support to build a series of plants using that technology. You know, so that's not going out and sticking our neck out and attempting to, we're not in the technology business. Of, taking our own technology to produce this. We are integrating known patented processes that we pay a license fee for. If I could add a Alan, the people um, who actually own the technology, these technologies are extremely keen to license them to companies such as ourselves. That is where they will generate their income streams from their uh, their own research and development investments. Okay, so um, on that uh, line of reasoning, who is it that you're paying for this technology? There are several options within this, but I mean, at the moment, we're dealing with Southern Research and the technology that Fulcrum and um, Southern Research have been trialing for the last five years. I understand. Thank you. No. Alderman, Alderman Stearns. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Coos. Um, I just I wanted to ask a couple things about the waste supply contract. And first, will that will contracts be sought from other um, municipalities or officials outside of Bloomington Normal? Um. um. I mean, primarily at the moment, the waste supply that would come through these two agreements, both Bloomington and Normal, is not that much. It's about 120 tons, if that. At the moment, there's about 450 tons a day going into the um, McLean County landfill, and we would augment that with some biomass. I mean, we are not going outside of McLean County to um, secure contracts with other municipalities at the moment. I mean, we're not shipping in waste from Chicago or up okay. from St. Louis, if that is the question. That, that is the question, and I guess I think what I'm hearing is that perhaps you're not seeking um, to negotiate with other municipalities or officials outside Bloomington Normal, but that would be an, an option for you in the future. You're leaving yeah. that open, I would gather. The, the answer is we have not yet done that. Until we secure the first two, there's no reason to go try to get others because without the first two, the others are not relevant. Okay, but with the first two, there's a possibility that you could and would go outside Bloomington Normal. Yes, there are about 900 tons a day produced of uh, municipal waste in McLean County, and we need to get 600 of that, and that's the idea, uh, to try to do it from McLean County, not Chicago or St. Louis. We that, that, is, that is the idea. Um, but the possibility, I mean, you wouldn't be, uh, you wouldn't be guaranteeing that you wouldn't go outside Bloomington Normal? No. no. Okay. And that, that's clear. Is a couple more quick things on the waste supply contract. Is um, Paradigm currently negotiating with anyone else for a waste supply contract currently? Negotiating yeah, with? Robert, yeah, Robert right just indicated that um, with Tom Kirk, we are looking at a further supply of 250, 300 tons. We have talked to other waste providers, and predominantly the haulers will be the, the providers of this. If we produce a tipping rate to dispose of MSW that is cheaper than the current landfill or 
shipping down to Clinton or Pontiac, then commercially it's more attractive for them to, to, to come locally than, you know, drive 40 miles to pay more money, so to speak. Okay. So, so shipping fee has got to be competitive in that sense. Okay. So you're currently negotiating with, with Tom Kirk. I've heard that. Um, and that's understood. When will this waste supply contract, or is it is this the availability now for public comment tonight, or is there another opportunity for public comment on this waste supply contract? Uh, at, at such time as this would go to either body, I think there would there would be a time for that. There will be some public comment at the end of this meeting. Uh, but we pushed it to the end because we wanted people to hear all this information first before they uh, came forward. But yes, there'll be uh, plenty of opportunity for public. So, and, and the, this contract is it available currently online at the moment? I'm not sure if it's online, but it will be available. Yeah, we have copies available for the general public. It's been given to the media. Oh, it's hit. We've been trying to apply in the negotiations with contract is one to fix the term. Um, in five-year increments. So instead of an annual inflation of costs that you see in your current contract, we are fixing the price for a five-year term. There is a re-entry clause that if we provide a lower rate to anyone else, then the cities have the option to um, renegotiate the contract. Um, you know, we're talking of, you know, 120, 130 million of capital cost, and from that perspective, bondholders want to know that there is a source of MSW that is relied upon and that the city's contributions here of, um, we'll call it a grouping of 120 tons, is, you know, a, just a portion of this requirement. The reason it's a 20-year contract is we, we you know, need to know that we've got long-term arrangements and that they quite frankly that the cities want this to happen you know if you are skeptical about it and you don't want this to happen then it will not happen because we're putting up the capital cost for it there is a benefit and we've tried to incorporate what is either a reasonable or a substantial benefit to the cities um this industry, whilst it's in change, is not going to happen quickly because of the time it takes to go through siting ordinance and the time it takes to build a plant. I don't think you're suddenly going to see a competitive technology. The Bloomington normal area does not have a high amount of waste. I mean, it's marginal when you talk about 600 tons to make a plant work. You know, much better to put it in Chicago where you've got, you know, 17,000 tons a day just going into the Pontiac landfill. But we are developing working practices. We are developing an integration of taking out a high degree of the recyclables that are currently still in the waste stream after you go through your separated uh, um, bins at you know at the household. Um, these technologies have come a long way to separating them out. They're much more prevalent in Europe than they are in America at the moment. Um, you know, this is not, these kind of plants, it's like building a power station, you know, yes, the technology will change in the years to come, but it's not going to be that quick, you're not going to suddenly see somebody turn up in Bloomington and compete with a plant here, because there just isn't enough waste. If it was Chicago, you would probably see two or three of these plants when all of these issues are, are worked out. The advantage here for Bloomington is it's a fairly small scale plant. And, you know, we can go at it in a pragmatic way, which a larger plant has much higher risk. And so it's scaled at 130 million and this kind of volume to allow a, a reasonable process to take place to make this happen. It's also why the University of Illinois, you know, wants the research center here because getting this right in Bloomington will allow for multiple plants to be built and there's about 500 that are needed states um you know to be developed and you know i think the issue that you're talking about here when you say um should you be committing to these kind of lengths of contracts and you know is somebody going to come along and offer something alternative 
for the kind of volumes that you've got in Bloomington, it's not one where you can go out to tender and get competitive bids because it's really quite marginal to be able to do this. You know, it is, it's the right size for the moment of where the industry is in its development. There is a plant going into London which is going to process 830,000 tonnes a year. That's a big plant, and the risk of you know delay in that is a big financial risk. And so doing it at the scale in Bloomington is a good forerunner for somewhere like Chicago. And I will say we are in discussions with the people up in Chicago who look to this type of plant to support O'Hare and Midway. But they'd rather see something right now today at a scale that can be managed before committing half a billion dollars into a plant the size of what would be needed to service, um, you know, Chicago. So, so that's to try and put it in context of where we are with it. Okay. Okay. Good. Thank you. Um, <coughs> thanks for the presentation. I, I actually had a lot of questions that have been answered already, so that, that's very nice. Um, the one question that I have, though, is about the economics of uh, this model and what you're trying to accomplish. And I'm thinking about it from, um, <coughs> from the perspective of Bloomington, but also the pers perspective of the average person. Uh, so as I'm understanding it, you, um, so we have to pay basically a fee to get our natural resource to be transported, right? Transformed. You, yeah, transformed. So we're, we're paying you. Okay. Instead of paying a tipping fee to put it in a right. landfill, yes. And we are also paying to transport that to you, it sounds like, at least from what I've seen. Mm -hmm. uh, you're doing that now by going to the landfill. Uh, you would just come to us instead. Right. So, <clears throat> which I understand, um, in the beginning, as you're trying to build up your business, but it sounds like in the latter years, it's going to be fairly profitable, right? We hope so. <laughs> we hope so. So, that's, so you know, you're risking $130 million of yeah. money to do that. Right. Right. <clears throat> so then, to me, I, I think there's somewhat of a contradiction because I, I think if we are providing you with a natural resource, you know, to, to do what you need to do and to make money, then we should be able to, when the business is profitable, to share in some of the profits. At least the average person on the street is thinking about it in those terms. Because otherwise, if, if we're not able to, then it almost makes it seem like you're you're not confident that in the latter years you're going to be profitable. That's my... Well, the, alter the alternative is this. Don't enter into a contract. We'll choose whether we do or don't build a plant in Bloomington. If we do build it there, you'll pay whatever rate we put on the table, or you'll truck it down to Clinton or to Pontiac, which mm -hmm. is the situation you've got right now. And your fees are certainly, unless you do a better deal than you have currently will be higher. And that is an option. You don't have to do this. Mm -hmm. But if you want to support <clears throat> this and encourage it to come, that's what we're asking you to do because we're taking a lot of risk. Mm -hmm. If you want to participate in this plant, and we are talking about a 501c3, we're willing to talk about that too. But, you know, we're putting out money and you are disposing of your waste stream cheaper than you are today or your prospects for doing it in the future. So we're not actually taking anything from you. We're providing you with an opportunity to fix the price at a lower rate than you have in any contract going forward. Mm -hmm. If you don't want to take advantage of that or you want to participate in the plant, then become part of that um, plant. Put up some risk. You could, you know, for no tipping fee, you could save in 10 years $15 million. That's mm -hmm. what you're going to pay in your tipping fees over the next t 10 years. Do you want to put up security, you know, behind building a plant for that risk of not paying $15 million? Mm -hmm. 
I mean, you know, come into this, actively come into it, and participate in it. Yeah, actually, we're not asking you to give us something <clears throat> for nothing. You are getting a lower rate than you've got anywhere else. Or don't do that, and we'll charge you a full rate. And you may pay 20 or 30 million over the next 10 years, because once you have to start trucking your waste down to Pontiac or over to <clears throat> Flint, you've got about a $15 a ton trucking rate. I mean, so how how did you come to that particular rate then in the latter years? You know, it's what you said, fifty five, fifty four, something like that. We've taken the current rates of what you have got in contract mm -hmm. and fixed them for five years. So the rate in two thousand and eighteen is steady for five years, mm -hmm. and then there is a um, it's about a. 14 point something, 15% increase, step increase, and then it's fixed for another five years. So we're risking, um, you know, the fixing the rate with you for five year increments, which I don't think anybody else, you know, has ever been done in any of your contracts today. It, it does speak to the 20 year contract. Really, we're hoping to sell to our bankers that it's a 20 year contract. It isn't, it's a five year contract. It's four or five year contracts. You can get out each time. Mm -hmm. If you don't like the rate, you're done. And if we don't provide what we say we're going to, <clears throat> you have no contract. You don't have to do it. <clears throat> if the EPA doesn't approve it, you have no contract. I'm going to ask legal staff to uh, interject on that because that is certainly not what the, the, this council uh, has been led to understand that we have four or five year contracts here. Rate, re rate reopener. You, as far as rate. Right. Yeah. No, you have a 20 year contract, but you can get out if the rate doesn't meet your approval. And, and believe me, we spent <laughs> a lot of time <laughs> with both attorneys and both city managers on this issue. And in Boca, we, we really said if, if you want to enjoy some of the rewards in the future, uh, we're happy. Just take some of the risk with us now. Whatever portion of the $130 million you want to spend, we'll, we'll give you that percentage going forward. They didn't want to do that. Uh, Mr. Fizzini is correct in that he did spend a substantial amount of time <laughs> talking to staff <laughs> on this particular issue. Um, I've got a slightly different interpretation of the language in front of us. It's on page four. It's section 2.1 of the waste supply agreement. Under this, it's a 20-year term from the operational date or whenever Paradigm ceases its operation of the facility. Uh, the city may further reopen the agreement at the commencement of each 5, 10, and 15-year anniversaries of the operational date to renegotiate the disposal costs if the total per ton disposal cost of the MSW waste stream delivered by the city is more than the lowest comparable regular rate charged by Paradigm to any other customer. So if on the 5, 10, and 15 year anniversary they are charging a lower comparable rate to somebody else, then we can renegotiate on the rate issue. A um, couple of issues with that. First of all, there has to be a comparable rate in effect on the date of that 5, 10, 15 year. Um, and as I mentioned, we've got some confusion as to a definition of what is a comparable rate. Um, who decides what a comparable rate is? How does that happen? Um, there's also some other technical issues with this I don't want to go into now, but we'll have to do some technical redrafting on part of this just to ensure that this doesn't occur until our existing contracts expire. Yeah, and, and Brian, the, the key word here is any other customer. So effectively, if we have other customers, and since you only have approximately 120 tons of the 600 that we need, and frankly, uh, the maximum is 1,000, uh, our goal is to move it up between 600 and 1,000, obviously. Uh, so if we move it up to 1,000 and you have 120 tons, and say yours goes up to 150 in five years, you're 15% of our total. So we have 85% of our total coming from lots of other places. And if any 
one of those sources has a lower rate, you get it. And we're not going to be able to be in business if we're not giving comparable rates to people out in the market. So it, it is a matter of you actually every five years get to get the lowest rate that's out there. I think we understand that. And I think as, as uh, Mr. Day pointed out that there's certainly a lot of work to do on that clause in terms of how it, how it defines. But sure. uh, you know, I'm choosing to read that right now that we have a 20 year agreement on that cannot be affected um, unless. I think taking Mr. Hale's point that if another technology comes mm -hmm. along, you know, are you stuck with um, something when others are mm -hmm. producing technology and they're taking waste, as it were, for nothing? And, and, and it would course. beg the question if you did round two in year 10 with another municipality, is that a comparable customer or not? Or is any customer that we deal with? You know, I, I mean, I think the intent there was a reopening, but I mean, the point is, taking Mr. Hale's point about other technologies, if other technologies come along that offer a cheaper rate to process MSW, the 85% customers are likely to put us out of business if we don't match that lower rate. So your protection is you are far from being the majority of that waste stream. In fact, you are a very small minority of it. And the other customers, commercial customers, are going to insist upon getting the best rate that they can at the moment. If they can go to a different landfill, they will. So, you know, the market will take care of that. If a new technology comes along that, you know, takes waste for nothing, we are not going to have haulers bringing us waste at the price that's in there for you. In fact, you know, that's a beneficial rate to you as it stands. I now, think if you're not happy with the way the language reads on that, the intent was quite clear. Fix it. I think based on the discussion we're having back and forth here between attorneys and, and members <laughs> that I'm going to say that this is not completely clear to this to this body what what that actually means. Uh, I think the principle is clear. If the words here don't make it clear, I think we could fix that. Um, I have a question in terms of uh, um, uh, technology, you know, in a global sense right now, there's a, in a global sense of manufacturing, there's certainly a lot of emphasis on uh, recyclables and reusables um, in, in materials from packaging materials in terms of um, milk bottles that are being recycled into uh, fabrics. Uh, the list goes on and on and on. Uh, the carpet in this particular room is 100% is recycled material. And this is, uh, this is a trend that's growing, not shrinking. Uh, so what uh, would happen in year 10 if Paradigm found itself in a position where it was not able to get enough municipal solid waste from this community? We'd get it from somewhere else. <laughs> it's not just municipal solid waste. Really what we're after is carb carbon, carboniferous material. So that can be in the form of agricultural waste. It can be in the form of... Um, woody biomass, um, there are a number of different forms of organic. MSW, you know, is one form of that. And with gasification, we have the, the, the ability to process different forms of waste. We, we could do railroad ties, we could do telephone poles. Which uh, are currently are recyclables, and, and you, we uh, was stated no, earlier, not, you were not going to touch. Those aren't recyclables. Railroad ties and, and or creosote uh, railroad ties, I'll give you, are not recyclable. Yeah, those yeah. are not. Yeah. But th they are something that we could use. It, we wouldn't have to go with but just MSW. Most wood products are recyclable. Yeah, no, not the ones with creosote. Right. <laughs> Mr. Sage. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and I, I guess maybe I wanted to, to follow up or tag on a little bit to, to what Mboka suggested and then, and then um, you know, Mayor, what you suggested. I guess. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to kind of go out into the future a little bit in, in, in terms of, of in, in, in what scenario. I mean, we, we have the forecast, we have the estimations. Um, can, can, in, in what scenario do we, we get to a point where, where the, somehow the, the, the city and the town uh, were penalized for, for, for any aspect of this? Of this process, and 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 as David suggested, I think in his experience in Utah, where you know their unit cost changed dramatically, 
and and all of a sudden um, through through perhaps nobody's fault you know your fault my fault nobody's fault it became extremely burdensome to the the, the citizens and the taxpayers in that community that's that's I guess what I'm hearing, and, and I think maybe that's what Mboka was suggesting, and I think maybe the dynamic, Chris, that you, you alluded to, was if, if we continue to see just ever-increasing diversion rates for recycled materials and, and our municipal solid waste uh, volume drops to a point, it, it's, do, are we on the hook, you know, for, for that, um, or is, is all of the, to make up the, the, the cost of that, if you will, or is that just simply a uh, paradigm having to go out and cast a bigger net outside of McLean County, if you will, or, or, or other, other aspects? Good, good question, and I think uh, part of it is, in Bloomington at least, we've been increasing 1,000 citizens a year for many years. We're gonna have increased population in both communities, I think. So as we have a bigger percentage of uh, recyclables, uh, I think uh, behind me somewhere is, uh, is our public works director. Our, our percentage of uh, recyclable, or people doing recycling right now is over 70%. Jim, is that accurate? 66. 66? 66. Oh, 76. So we're at 76% recyclable now, uh, are people recycling. It'd be great to get up to 80 or 85, but at some point, that's going to, it's going to peak. Everybody isn't going to recycle. So we have a big portion recycling already. And I think that's, that's a good, and that's good. We don't want those recyclables in our municipal waste. We have to take them out if we get them. So we'll have more people and we will have more opportunity to have garbage. But if we need to go a little further out to get it, that's what we'll do. If we have to broaden and not just take garbage, but take railroad ties and take telephone poles and take other things, we'll do that. Our process will allow it. So the fact that you can get out every five years, uh, I believe the fact that you are less than 20% of the total and will be less than 15% if we have our say, uh, that gives you a way to get out very easily because anybody who is getting a lower price at the five years is going to be what you get. I'm going to I think say again what uh, Mr. Bryan, uh, Mr. May just telegraphed to me with his uh, citing. Uh, it is not clear that we can get out every five years. Mm -hmm. I'll just say that for the record. Yeah. Well, well, I think the other thing that you also need to look at underneath this is you're not committing to provide any volume of MSW. So we're committing to pay a host fee based on a minimum per quarter, irregardless of what we process. You are not committing to provide X tons per day other than you will take your waste to us and we will accept it. But if your waste stream drops to a quarter of what it is, the risk is on us. You are not fixing a volume and therefore a payment to us. We would like it that you did, but that's not what is there. So in terms of are you supporting something artificially, I can't see how this contract does that because you are not committing a fixed amount of money and if you, you can dispose of it cheaper somewhere else, you're going to go elsewhere. If the market can find somewhere else that's cheaper to get rid of the waste, our prices will either have to reflect that or we'll be out of business. And I think what we need to do, as much time as we've already spent on this with all of the attorneys, ours and Included, is get the language to where you're comfortable that reflects what we're telling you right now today okay. and we'll get it there I'm sensing mr. may has a comment on this or not uh, certainly I think in terms of what Rob is saying we need to go back and look at this provision pretty strongly um, while we don't have a set number of tons that we do have to deliver we do have a commitment that we deliver all that oh. we've got and so that makes a pretty big distinction. So if we find a lower uh, supplier or somebody to take it at a lower price somewhere else, we can't just pick up and go somewhere else. We are still committed to supplying 100% of our municipal solid waste to Paradigm. Thank you. Ms. Gaines? Well, I was just curious because I've heard a couple of times uh, 501c3s involved, and, and I'm not quite understanding that because 
you're talking about a personal or you know a, a corporate enterprise then a 501 c3 I don't, I'm not understanding how that would come into play and how you would see us involved in that and make a lot of money Pardon? and make a lot of money and make, yeah there you go share with charities uh, Alan or Michael <laughs> do you want to tackle that um, the actual plant itself can be um, the ownership and the um, the value of the plant can be in a 501c. You can deal with your products through a consortium and a management agreement. Um, and if the plant was disposed of and uh, there was a profit made on that, there can be a distribution of that. So there are mechanisms where municipalities can have an ownership and a certain degree of management in a facility that is a not-for-profit enterprise. As Robert has pointed out, you're already doing that in a commercial enterprise that was originally the um, ISU broadband network, which has now gone into a company that is commercially selling broadband capacity, but it is um, a, a, an entity in which you, you, the city of Bloomington, and the town of Normal are participants. Yeah, at 25% at each, and it is a 501c3. Mr. Scott. Yes, I'd like to go back to the volume and uh, source of MSW conversation. And I recognize that there is no uh, set number of tons that we would be required to deliver, but we are required to deliver all. The desired amount is 1,000 tons per day, as I understand, correct? Uh, the, the projected amount is 600. The maximum is 1,000. And we'd like to move it from 600 to 1,000 after it's up and running properly. As but I sure. said, the desired yeah. amount is 1,000 tons a day. And it's been stated that we can only no, provide. No, no, no. Stop, stop. Go ahead. Stop. 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 I'm stopping. We're Please. stopped. <laughs> the plant is going to be scaled at the moment for 600 tons a day. That's what we're looking at at the operational throughput. We put a cap of 1,000 on it. Whether in time we need to move it up or not, that's product of success. But, you know, don't immediately move to a 1,000 tons a day because it's not being designed. The lines are not being designed. We are designing it financially and the uh, operating costs and the um, ability to support the uh, financing of it is based on 600 tons a day. Okay, that's fine. We'll still work off of percentages then rather than actual tonnage. Um, if we're at 600 tons per day and it's been stated that we can we as a community can only generate about 15 percent of the material that's needed that means that we can generate about 90 tons of the 600 that you need so does that mean that we would be shipping in or you would propose to be shipping in 510 tons of municipal solid waste into our community each and every day yeah chuck it's about 120 tons that the two communities together currently have okay so that that's close so to you'd 20 be 480 tons right uh, that would be shipped into our community each and every day? No, uh, by at the snow. moment you are depositing into the landfill from commercial haulers within the city, the universities, all of the other providers of waste because you are a smaller part than the rest of the commercial community. Something like 500, 450 to 500 tons they go into the landfill currently over off of Washington Street. So it's not shipping it in, per se, from other communities. It's what is generated. And there's about 900 tons a day that are generated in McLean County, some of which goes down to Clinton. Um, that, you know, is more than the 600 tons we're looking at. And that's before you deal with woody biomass, whether it's agricultural waste or whether it's um, currently uh, treated woods and other things which cannot be recycled. So... You know, that, that we don't see we're reaching out beyond McLean County at the moment up to Chicago or anywhere else to ship in waste. I mean, that's a hysterical kind of fear that we're bringing something in that isn't already in the community. That answer or not, Chuck? Somewhat. Somewhat. Yeah. <laughs> what are we missing? Continue on, please. Okay. Ms. Holland? Um, a couple questions for you um, concerning the environment, uh, it appears that there's a zero waste implied in the in the contract, um, or maybe contract isn't the right word. Um, and I'm, there's a, a question about whether um, that 
what evidence you have that it would be a zero waste process? Is it being done somewhere else We're with, with yeah. that? Yeah, um, I mean, in, in Europe, a number of countries now have no landfill, so you have to process all the waste into either usable materials or an inert material that can be used in another way into construction or into fertilizers or what have you. And so the majority of this, I mean, we we will end up with a certain amount of biochar, which is an agricultural, high-value agricultural product. Um, there may be a small one or two percent of an inert matter that can go into building materials. But, you know, that whether it's Holland or um, parts of Germany, um, Japan, you know, they're all heading towards what is called zero waste. I mean, the term is zero waste. It's that there are s very small percentages that you know have to be used in other ways, but it's pretty much getting down to the one or two percent that may end up in building materials or something like that. Okay, and what would the impact of the process have on um, water? We are a net generator of water, clean water. Currently, MSW um, depends on you know time of year and what's going on but you know the, the moisture content is let's call it around 28 percent and we will reduce it to 15 percent and so we'll be producing about 120 about 60 tons of water a day clean water thank you, you. Uh, kind of a follow-on to that one um so you're producing water how much of that water are, will you be using in the process um, say for quenching the bottom of the ash with the water or um, and how many gallons per hour would you need uh, to um, produce to uh, to take care of your own operation um, we're not quenching anything with this um, it's not a water-based um, control temperature issue on this and we will be a net producer of water we were not be taking in water, you're a net producer of it. I think um, this line of discussion could go on for quite a while here, um, and I'm going to circle the conversation back a little bit if we can. Um, st staff has um, asked for this meeting, this joint meeting, to, de 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 to determine uh, if we would like to go forward uh, with the solid waste agreement and the hosting agreement for the for the um, for the communities um, and have asked two questions I think are pretty serious questions and I think are uh, cogent to the conversation here one um, uh, in in respect to paradigm aviation obviously a very entrepreneurial company they've spent a lot of time and effort on this process uh, do we have the comfort level to enter into a 20-year agreement um, that we are effectively locked into uh, with this organization I think that's the question we're charged to answer here tonight so I th if we can kind of circle into that conversation a little bit mr. McCarthy first I want to thank everybody for their presentations tonight I quite honestly two years ago when I sat down and heard this first presentation uh, Alan the only thing I could think of was flux capacitor from uh, back to the future tra trash to fuel um, and here we are talking about it two years later um, I really love the idea and I'm very supportive of looking for alternative ways to manage our waste and produce energy so I'm hoping if nothing else this spurns continued conversation and competitors quite frankly to come into our community that that have additional ideas to to take up this topic to help us figure this out because we do have a limited landfill space um, as a point of fact I want to correct something um, stated earlier according to British Airways and Solana websites the project that's over in Europe or in London um, uh, from both of their websites they say that their target is to process 575,000 tons of waste rather than 834,000 tons that's dry tons that's dry tons after they take 832,000 or 836,000 tons of 28% okay uh, and, and I, I I don't want to debate that specific point other than to say that that perhaps we are a bit more of an attractive community that competitors would be willing to look at that we're not such a small market
potentially. So something for us to consider as, as we consider entering into this agreement or other agreements like that. Um, to the contract, just a couple of questions really. Um, so there's been a, a, a question stated that we're not comfortable or, or not clear about whether or not we're actually going to have the opportunity to terminate the agreement every five years. Um, are you willing to state in plain language that we can, in fact, terminate the agreement in its entirety every five years? Alan or George, can you help me out on this? George, our attorney. <laughs> I think the answer to that question is obvious from this discussion that your administrative and legal staff are not comfortable with the existing wording. Based upon what uh, Alan and Rob have said tonight, uh, we're prepared to create language by the time this comes back to the respective councils that will be clear, concise, and provide the uh, town and the city respectively with the opportunity to exit if it is no longer the most economically viable option. So you're suggesting- The answer is yes. So there'll be some economic determination or some, some acid tests, if you will, under which uh, that will be able to terminate the agreement. Correct, and it'll be an objective one okay. that, that everyone's comfortable with. Uh, assuming that that was going to be some part of the answer, I've got a follow on to that one, is that in the similar direct question in plain language, are you willing to, to stipify that if we can find um, any technology that provides us a lower rate, that we can in, in terminate the agreement in its entirety? I'm gonna defer that to Alan. I'm unaware of such a technology. Alan? I don't know, you're trying to talk about language, remember, the object here is whilst you're not a large volume of MSW, you are the basis of the community and the financiers in the bond market want to know whether or not you are supportive of this project. And supporting, you know, anything less than 20 years, they are looking, you know, for this kind of money to build a power station or anything else that you're talking about they usually is at minimum 20 year lifespan so they are looking is the community behind this and that's really a question you know how it ends up being interpreted into an agreement you know i think the difficulty is you kind of want your cake and eat it too do you want to move in this field and have this technology here in bloomington or do you just want to see what comes along you want to see if there's other technologies but are you willing to spend the money to go out and put together some sort of rfi to try and get other technologies i think when you try and do that with the volume of msw you've got 120 tons um you can't build a plant for 120 tons but you know are you prepared to do that you haven't been willing to go out and find other technologies um, the financial market wants to know whether or not um, you're behind this. Um, my concern all along is we're essentially a foreigner in the sense we're not country companies, we're not State Farm, we're not an incumbent um, in Illinois with paying tax. And if you want to dispose of us, and there was a stage in the negotiations where it was proposed that you paid no tipping fee whatsoever um, then we can spend and we've already spent you know well over a million and a half dollars in pursuing this um, and we're going to spend another 4.3 million just in getting through a siting ordinance before we even know whether we've got the ability to build a plant in Bloomington so really part and parcel of this contract is does the community want to come behind and encourage this to happen or not? And that's the basis of this whole um, supply agreement. The host agreement is something that has to happen before we go into siting ordinance. 
Um, it provides you with an income, and that would be standard for anybody applying for a transfer station. You would want to have a host agreement with them. But the supply agreement, you know, is a demonstration that you feel you want this to come into your community, at least as far as the New York uh, bankers are concerned. And if you water it down to it's a five-year contract, you can terminate it at any point in time. If there's another technology, then quite frankly, I'm not sure we even want to bother with it because it has no value to us. Um, and, and that's really the bottom line on it. You know, Do you want this to happen in Bloomington? And if you've got other people that you think you can encourage to come in, then maybe you should turn your attention to other people. See if Republic will build a waste. Uh, you know, to jet fuel plant, or whether um, PDC will do it, um, or whether Tom Kirk will do it. You know, look to those people in your community, ask them whether they're prepared to put up this kind of money and what they would require from you to do it. So far, we haven't taken a penny from the community by way of any kind of support for this. Um, you know, and that's really what it's about. You know, that's what we're looking at and the New York bankers are looking at with these contracts is do you want this to happen are you willing to come behind it in some you know proper fashion not one that is um, putting you at financial loss we tried to structure it to where there's quite a substantial savings for you but if that doesn't work for you then you know we just need to know fairly quickly we've messed around with this now for three years um, we can't keep on doing that. We, we're at that point where we need to make a decision whether we're coming to Bloomington or not, and that's what this is about. And Robert, I think you need to speak to that. I, I think I, I want to interject a little, kind of answer to that a little bit. I think we're we're all aware of what you guys need to get your financing in order. You've made that point several times. Um, and I think it's a little disingenuous to assume that we're not serious by um, spending a serious amount of staff time and dollars and do this and it's quite frankly a little offensive um, so uh, I think for us if we enter into agreement that has the the year 20 or the term 20 years on it I personally um, I can't speak to any of my counterparts uh, in Bloomington or here in normal but if I vote in favor of an agreement that has a 20-year term on it, it's because we're pretty serious about it but our responsibility on this side of the agreement is to protect the citizens and, um, and, and do our due diligence to protect our community. And so in an industry that is, is new, I hope that you can appreciate that we're not looking to, um, to inhibit your ability to raise capital, but rather to protect our own interests. And that we're looking for, uh, at least so far from what I've heard tonight, we're looking for some insurances that um, should this not turn out to be what we have, that we have the ability to to do that, to protect our citizens. And that's that's the basis for the, the questions specifically <coughs> asking for specific provisions in, in plain language. I appreciate that. Kevin, uh, Thank you. Mayor, could uh, we have our uh, Attorney Miller uh, make a couple of points here? Because he was very much involved in all of the negotiations, uh, and I think we can clarify a couple of things here quickly. Sure. I actually want to talk about non-legalese things for just one second. I've done work for uh, the uh, larger waste companies uh, in the state, including Peoria Disposal and Republic, for uh, more years than I care to remember. Um, and I'm pretty familiar with the waste disposal industry and what's going on. I can tell you that those companies do not have R&D departments where they are studying alternative waste disposal technologies because they are so heavily invested in landfills and transfer stations. That's their bread and butter. I will also tell you that the common belief in the industry, in the industry that I work in, is that what Paradigm is attempting to do is not cost effective and not economically possible. Uh, the costs of source separation to, to create a clean organic fuel are high. The energy cost of gasification is high. The uh, cost of creating liquid fuel is high. This is not just money coming in at the end uh, when you sell aviation fuel. There's a lot of money going out 
before that money comes in. And uh, what is happening here is not that this is new technology. What Paradigm convinced me of when they got me to join the project is you're taking established components and combining them in a way that nobody has done on a commercial scale in the United States. People know how to run a MRF and separate uh, organics from recyclables and other waste. People know how to gasify. People know how to create fuel. Uh, the Germans uh, from uh, organics. The Germans did it in World War II. All of those things are known, but the components have not been combined at a commercial scale. It's going to happen. Somebody's got to be first. Uh, the reason I joined the project is because if this one's going to be first, I want my name attached to it. And I think that's the opportunity that Alan is offering. In terms of the reopener and uh, getting the community out, uh, if uh, this is no longer viable or effective or something else comes along, as a lawyer, I will work my hardest to make sure that everybody is content with clear, unambiguous language that allows that to happen. That, that helped, Kevin. Thank you. Other comments in this regard? Hopefully we're walking away giving staff some kind of signal whether we're going forward with this, whether we want to hear more, do we want to take more time on this. Matt, let me just support George on this. I mean, we recognize what your corporate responsibilities are, and we're not trying to drive you into something that is inappropriate. I mean, there's no point in doing that. We, you know, either we we enjoin in this where everybody is satisfied that we're encouraging something to happen and we're being prudent about it. I, you know, if I'm being um, particularly pedantic in one area, I've got a set of bankers sitting on the other side of it who are not as, um, shall we say, as <laughs> commercially willing about things. But, um, you know, it's got to work for everybody. It just, but what we can't see is something that is just so ridiculously, you know, irrelevant that you know that it doesn't work you know that at the end of the day that doesn't work for you either because the plant won't get built um so you know we we have to find a way that protects your duty to your citizens that you are um disposing of your waste in the most cost effective fashion and that you are supporting something without putting you know tax dollars or, or, or public dollars at risk um, and, and that's what we've been trying to find throughout through this agreement. I think, you know, that's something we've recognized in all of this negotiation, which has been going on for, it's just not new, it's been going on for about 18 months now. Well, I'll go ahead and, uh, and state my position on this. And I think that um, this is an, an exciting technology. It's a very risky technology. I know you're, you're at risk as a company doing this. It's uh, certainly no slam dunk. And, and you're aware of that, and your f financial backing is quite aware of that, too. I'm sure the terms that they're offering you are quite stringent. And the question for me is, are we that entrepreneurial as well that we, we're going to commit in, in that way? And frankly, I am, I am not comfortable doing that, and I, I say that with no casting no dispersion on the paradigm organization. It's just I don't think where we are right now uh, it seems like we have a lot of work to do here, and I know, uh, Alan, that uh, time is, is very important to you on this process. You've expressed frustration uh, in the past on how long this has taken. Um, so I'm trying to help move this process along. I, I don't know your, your, your stomach for, for taking this along further, but as it sits right now, I, I certainly can't support it. <coughs> I, I, um, I want to go back to a, a statement you made earlier. You said um, there were really two issues. One was, are we comfortable with 20 years? Uh, and I'm hearing uh, there's an opportunity to change that. I didn't hear what your second concern was. And perhaps it's the entrepreneurial side of this. If that's it, then thank you. I just that was didn't it. hear what your second concern was. It was the, um, the nature of the team. Uh, that this is new for, for this team, and you know that doesn't mean they're doomed to failure by any means, but uh, it's a very risky entrepreneurial undertaking. Thank you.
Anyone else? Well, at this point, I think, uh, staff, are you, do you have questions for this body? Can I just make one final one? Not, thank you. Francisco. Oh, okay. Um, I, ju I just can't help but weigh in on this 20 year. And, and I guess what's frustrating for us sitting here is we've spent hours and hours and hours negotiating agreement. And the folks in Paradigm Bioaviation, 20 years is a deal breaker. They have to have a 20 year agreement. We shared with them our concern. We shared this is going to be a hard sell. We have got to have a 20 year agreement. And then we sit right here today and I hear, well, yeah, we can, we can change the language. And I can't tell you how frustrating that is for staff. We have negotiated in good faith and we're, we're I mean, and this, was, this was a deal killer. 20 years we have to have it in order to get financing. I understand that, I mean, I, I, that's logical. But now I'm hearing that, oh no, we can do something different. And that's, to me, that speaks to credibility and it speaks to, uh, to, to my comfort level with the team. The other thing, the first thing I've heard this morning, today is, uh, about uh, 501c3. It's completely new information. I asked David, do you hear, five, five? never heard of anything about 501c3 until tonight. The other thing I hear tonight is there's three sites under consideration. I didn't know there was three sites under consideration. We've spent hours at the table and I'm getting new information tonight before the council that I haven't had. And that puts staff in a very uncomfortable situation. Uh, makes me even more uncomfortable with the legitimacy of what we've negotiated. So I just wanna, I just wanna share that frustration with the council and it, it, if I was in your shoes, that would give me pause for going forward because is clearly the landscape is changing even here tonight. And we thought we had a near final agreement because we've worked very hard on this and it sounds like we we don't and and so i question a lot of the assumptions that that were made or were some of the the absolute uh, 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 foundational components of the agreement that were communicated to us by uh, paradigm from the outset because we're hearing new information tonight and i think jeff and david will uh, agree that they're also learning new information tonight that has not been shared in the past so that's all I, I want to make that comment. Thank you. Mark, Mark can I just ask you that in that terms of the structure, um, I shared with you paperwork on the 501c3 structure <laughs> three or four months ago. Um, now, you may not remember that, but I showed you a diagram of it all. And I said, you know, and I asked you if we were to go that route, is it something you'd be interested in? You indicated that you would be. So. I, I can appreciate a lot of paper has gone between us, and you may not recollect that, but I'm not putting anything on the table at this meeting that we haven't already put on the table with you some time ago. It's never discussed That's in our negotiations. You may have, uh, I'll tell you, there's been a lot of paper shuffled between these two groups, paper, so that, but, but we have helpful. spent over the last three months many hours at the same table discussing it, and I don't recall, and I'll look at David, he doesn't recall, 501c3 was new. I'm not saying that's something we'd be interested in, I'm just saying it's another example of new information coming forward tonight that was never shared with us. And I don't, if, if there was a sheet of paper that was shuffled past me at some point, it's possible, but it was certainly not discussed during negotiations as one of the options. Um, I, we haven't even investigated. I have no idea whether it's a good idea or not. I wouldn't even begin to, even even come close to a recommendation one way or the other but it's another example of new information as is oh we could probably live with maybe less than 20 years maybe we could do a five-year out uh, you uh, know Mark, that's new that's new information. Yeah, Mark, we in this agreement we said 20 years we needed 20 years and we softened the language to 20 years with five-year outs I, I don't think we've changed anything we we gave in on that point and said we will have to fight with our bankers to get 20 years with five-year outs. There's no five-year outs, Rob. Well, th but there's there no five-year outs. There's a five-year reopener on rate. Let's yeah, not, not discuss a five this. Year let's, let's not okay. discuss this because I think it's pretty clear that it's not clear. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Sage. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, just just a, a couple of quick comments. Um, 
for me, one aspect of this is that, that, that managing our solid waste, that's really one of our core services. That's one of the core services we provide as municipal government. I mean, it, it, it's, it, it's in that same group as, as public safety, um, you know, getting fresh water into people's homes, getting, you know, storm and sewer water away from their homes, and, and um, it's, not, it's not something to be tampered with lightly, and I'm not suggesting that we're doing that. I'm just saying that that, that is really a fundamental core service we, we provide. And, and the other thought that occurs to me is that if we're viable as, as a first site for this, then, then I would assume we're viable for a second, you know, as a second site or a third site if this is done someplace else and, and, and is viable and effective, <coughs> then I, I guess I would have to assume that, that our viability would still be in place. Um, we just wouldn't have to be buying a machine that had serial number one on it, right? We'd, we'd have something that was, was a little bit more proven and, and, and a little bit more um, um, observable someplace else. If, if, in fact, we're viable today, I'm going to suggest we're, we're going to be viable at some point in the future, too. Thank you. Well, I think, in, in all fairness to staff, I have to ask the council here uh, to answer one of three questions. Yes, I think this is a great idea. No, I don't like this idea. Uh, yes, I'd like to know more about this so staff can, can go forward on this. And I think we need to send that message to them tonight. That was the whole point of this work session. So, Mr. McCarthy, I'm going to start with you. We're just going to go around, you know, uh, please be brief. And uh, if you've got something to say, don't, don't hold back. Got a timer, Mayor. <laughs> got it right now. Go. Um, I uh, actually appreciate... Um, Mr. Sage's comments that uh, I like the idea, but um, I'm not comfortable being a first site with the terms uh, and the entrepreneurial risk that you mentioned earlier going forward at this point. Thank you. Ms. Hellman? I'm coming in late to the game, I'm only being on the council for four weeks now, um, but I'm not comfortable moving forward with what I know. Thank you. Mr. Fritzen? You know, I think. Uh, I've been sitting here wrestling with, with, with uh, an aspect of this, and, and um, I think it's the it, it was mentioned by Mr. Peterson earlier and alluded to by by you, Mayor Coos, and probably some others here, and that is the um, that none of none of the principal participants in uh, paradigm have any track record uh, in this uh, industry. Uh, Mr. Robinson obviously speaks with a great deal of knowledge, uh, but it, it's it's still a trust us we can do this type of uh, approach to things, and and uh, I got to scratch my head and wonder why Bloomington Normal, of all the places you could locate, why Bloomington Normal, uh, and the only thing I've heard there is that uh, the scale is right for a startup, um, and yet. Uh, we're not unique as, as far as scale goes in, in this country, and, and most of the uh, references to where this is done in the United States is in the southeast. And we hear North Carolina, and we hear Department of Defense, and we hear Europe and whatever, but um, how in the heck do we land in Bloomington Normal? I, it's, it's kind of a head-scratcher for me when uh, it's one thing to have the entrepreneurial sense about it and to try to put together financing. I understand that that is We've we've seen that a lot in projects in normal over the last several years uptown here as as the economy flattened out. So we I under understand that and, and that uh, that's a difficult thing and a, and a huge thing. But if I'm going to build a plant, I've got to I've got to have technical people who can run it. And you know how are you going to relocate technical people from other places to Central Illinois for a startup? that uh, appears to be a significant risk. Uh, it sounds to me like in the United States, anyway, uh, based on just what I've heard here tonight is that, and, and, pre, uh, and previously as well, but uh, if there are technical people available, they must all be in North Carolina. You know, so I, I, I don't know why we, the, the, uh, this, all of this work isn't being done somewhere there to uh, try to determine if this is, uh, a, a viable thing to do in the United States that's not been done anywhere else uh, in the United States at this point. All that to say, I you know I have a lot of questions about uh, about the viability of of uh, just the, the the business side of it and uh, the ability to to build a plant and make a plant work in this location 
uh, with the with the supply that's uh, the supply chain that's available here uh, it makes no sense to me and and there's plenty of other things when it comes to the technical aspects we kind of got into some of the technical aspects of the process and everything else tonight which you know that's all a mystery to me I don't know how you take uh, uh, you know I don't I don't understand that don't I'm not a scientist I'm not a chemist I'm not you know a biologist I can I have to have a certain level of trust in order to proceed on something. I don't have that. Thank you. Um, I had the opportunity to uh, befriend a uh, fellow that's just getting into the consultancy. He's been with wa uh, waste management, a major uh, player in the waste uh, uh, disposal industry, and I sought some advice. And uh, his uh, advice would be to uh, proceed with extreme caution, especially financially. Um, he has been involved for over 30 years, he's now retired, um, with um, um, this aspect of, of waste disposal and trying to develop this technology. They are uh, a very well-funded company in the state of Illinois and uh, have been trying to work on this at some sort of larger scale and have not developed it to this point. And uh, so um, his advice was that the, the landscape is uh, littered with these types of ventures and uh, you know, eventually somebody's going to get there. That's true, but there's an awful lot of uh, pitfalls uh, that could befall um, not only uh, the venture capitalist and and the uh, and the uh, entrepreneur, but also the town and the city here, and and possibly even the county. And so um, at this point, I've got I've just got a huge number of questions that I would want to be satisfied before I would say yes. Thank you, Reese. I appreciate the comments that everybody's given, and I really appreciate the uh, work that staff has done on behalf of both cities. I, I believe that we have to look to the future for some changes in the way we handle our solid waste. Uh, landfills are probably not the long-range answer. However, I don't know that the very first major idea that's come to us is the one we're ready to sign on to for 20 years. I, I'm uh, needing to know much more about who else is developing other programs, other services, what other cities are exploring this. Uh, we don't necessarily have to be the first. We don't want to be the last either. I think somewhere in that process um, we need to keep learning. We have very experienced staff on behalf of both cities that are, are well attuned to this. And I appreciate um, this discussion tonight, but I hope it will continue to come forward from those of you that manage our solid waste from both of our cities. Get us better educated, get us better informed on what's going on in other places so we, in fact, are, are able to make uh, a, a wide uh, understanding, wider understanding of what's going on. So that would be my hope at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, uh, for myself personally, I think this is a very interesting concept. Uh, when I first heard about it, I was very excited because I like new things and things that kind of push the envelope. Um, uh, but I, I, I very much would like to continue the conversation. Uh, my experience being on the council has been that once an idea is introduced and it's fairly serious and the community awakens to it, uh, you know, it, it does take a little while for the community to awaken to it. So I, I, I think we need to have a little bit more conversation about it. I've heard a couple of things, and I certainly appreciate uh, City Manager Peterson uh, for sh uh, sh sharing, Town Manager <laughs> Peterson for sharing his uh, trepidation uh, about the, the process. I, I think it, it does, um, uh, it gives me pause for concern, you know, to, to hear that things are shifting and, and changing, uh, um, especially on, the, on an important day like this. Um, I, 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 I would echo what I've heard from, from others that the, uh, the team uh, does not have a, a lot of experience with, with this process. Uh, it's their first time doing it and that, that to me seems to be quite a bit of risk <laughs> for a first time. Uh, I would have liked to see maybe uh, the, the, the trial happen somewhere else. <laughs> 
and, and, and then we can figure out whether or not it's going to work here. Um, so I, I'm not saying no, but I, I, I think it does give me a little pause for concern. Um, there, and of course, there's also the question of the, the, the finances to me, and I do understand that the team is taking quite a bit of risk, but you know, how much value do you put on risk? That's debatable. Why $50 per ton? <laughs> Why not 20? <laughs> Why not 35? I don't know. That's something to me, um, you know, I, at least from where I sit, because I haven't, you know, delved into all the details, uh, you know, that can be, it can seem subjective. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, the, if, in my opinion, I mean, the, the city could push a little harder to, to get a better rate when it comes to that. Um, and, and again, to, uh, to kind of go back to the team taking such a risk, in, in, in my opinion, it's kind of similar to, you know, somebody having a passion for food, <laughs> but then starting a restaurant. I mean, we've seen that quite a bit. <laughs> and, you know, we, we've seen quite a bit of failures, you know, in the restaurant business. So um, that's what makes me a little bit uncomfortable about the whole situation. But I'm willing to continue the conversation. Mr. Frohn. A uh, very good discussion tonight over the last two hours, and I think it's obvious at least halfway through that there's a lot of uh, consensus of reservation and hesitation. And I know everybody has talked about the investment of time that everybody has spent on this, and I value that. Uh, kind of reminds me of a phrase that uh, I don't know what I don't know. And in that kind of situation, I remind myself that I re rely on the, uh, the advisors, and in this case, the staffs of both communities. And um, if I was going to align with any comments that have been said, I think it'd be with uh, Council Member Reese because we are just not as educated on this as we should be. We know there's a need out there. We know we've got a concern. And we're just now learning a little bit about more some of the technology that's available to us. Um, I just don't think we're there yet. I think we've got some ways to go. And with that said, I, I don't think I'm encouraging city staff to pursue it further. I don't think that's a, 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 a good use of time. I think there's enough hesitation and reservation and concern that we would just be continuing to uh, spin our wheels. And I don't think we're ready to pull the trigger on this. I really value the amount of time that Paradigm has put into this because I think it's uh, going to be here someday. I just don't think we're quite there yet. Um, I want to. I do want to say thank you to Paradigm, to the <coughs> town staff, to the city staff, um, all the attorneys' work, everyone's work that's been put into this. You know, when this first uh, was spoken about, I, I, I too was kind of excited because, wow, that's, you know, on the cutting edge of things. I think, though, that for me, um, I'm a little bit gun shy in, in the fact that um, we've had some other enterprises. We have, I have one in particular I'm thinking of that was going to come and do great things and bring good things to the community. It didn't work out. And then we end up taking valuable land and putting something on it that has cost people a lot of money and can't be, isn't finding a good use yet. It has not found somebody to make it their home. And I, that's what I'm afraid of here. Plus, I guess I'm, I'm just, I'm also thinking, not like I'm a financial person, but you know how difficult it is to get things financed I, I, I still question that, and if we aren't putting the cart in front of the horse when we're trying to do all this work to make it work here when we don't know if, if there's even that capability of bringing it here. So I, I guess I want to, want to say I hope it happens. I hope Paradigm does this. Um, if they came back and everything was much clearer and, and ready to go, I'd be ready to jump on the horse and ride away, but right now I just don't. I just don't think we're at that spot. So um, I, I, I guess I don't want the staff to spend an inordinate amount of time anymore because it's it's costing the taxpayers. I just want to gamble. This entrepreneurial side of things is basically saying let's just gamble at this time with taxpayer dollars, and I don't think I'm really willing to do that. Okay. 
Well, I echo what Cheryl just said. And my other concern is that this is a viable, marketable technology. I know that ASTM International approves three processes so far for converting trash, more or less. Uh, one is SIP, which uses fermented sugars, and the other one is HEFA, which uses plant oils and animal processing waste, and then FT, which uses biomass and fossil fuel feedstocks. And maybe you can separate all of those things out, but I, I don't know if you can or not. Um, and that's where I am wavering. Um, and also, I think that if this really becomes a lucrative enterprise, that as time goes by, you could give us a little better break on the tip fee. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I do appreciate all your effort in this, and I think this green technology is really exciting, and it's the wave of the future. Um, but I'm just not totally convinced. Thank you. I'm not um, not willing to obligate this community or these these councils or councils in the future to a 20-year um, agreement. And I think that uh, that should send a strong message to staff about this particular negotiation process in this project, as well as um, future projects that are looking out 20 years into the future. Yeah. Ms. Kearns? Well, a large amount of time has been spent. Time is money. So a lot of taxpayer dollars have been invested in this, whether town or city. And I can't add too much or take too much more time except to, <laughs> except to say that uh, I'm not willing to bring solid waste in to our community. And I believe that is definitely um, something that, that would that could and, and no doubt would happen, and I, I don't think that our citizens want anyone else's garbage brought in. Thank you. As many others have, I would like to also express my thanks, Paradigm, to you guys for uh, the many months and, uh, and years of work, of course, to uh, the town and city staffs. Um, attorneys, this, uh, this is something that's been um, a long time coming, this conversation. And I also want to thank everyone uh, who came out tonight. Uh, this is quite a uh, quite a large crowd and I think it's something um, that just goes back to a point that Mr. Sage made earlier. You know, municipal waste is a core service that we provide um, at the city and the town level. And you know, I'm under the impression that it's something that we have to guarantee that we can get right. Um, to echo a couple of the concerns of my colleagues without being redundant, uh, I think because of the risk tolerance, um, in the length of the contract at 20 years, it's something that I um, am not comfortable seeing staff continue to pursue. Mr. Sage. Thank you, Mayor. And, and, and again, uh, obviously when you go last, it's hard not to repeat what others have said. And so, um, so I'll be as brief as I can. Um, I was going to start with here's, you, but that would be equally as <laughs> troubling. <appreciate that. laughs> Uh, again, I'll, I'll say thank you to, to all the all of our groups. I know city, uh, town staff, uh, Paradigm staff have put a tremendous amount of time into that. Here's here's just uh, maybe three or four observations. Um, the, the 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 disconnects, the the contract disconnects that have have kind of become evident here tonight between Paradigm and 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 city and town staff. That's a real red flag for me. And, and I even um, and appreciated uh, Mr. Peterson kind of emphasizing that because um, at this point in the game, um, we, I would have anticipated that, that there would have been much more of a completed deliverable um, that, that we were looking at tonight. Um, I, I think somebody mentioned this is a new process, although um, it's it suggested that, that it's, it's the subcomponents that are making up this new process are more, perhaps a little bit more proven and a little bit more reliable, but still this is a new process, that, that's a cause for me. And, and then this idea of, of just simply turning over a core service to the first provider who would approach us about doing that, um, to, to me it, it, it would, it, and, and again, no, no two situations are alike, but, but I know certainly if we, 
knew that we, we were going to have to get out of the water business, I'm sure we'd want to look, you know, we'd want to understand what all of our options are. Um, we wouldn't simply necessarily sign on with the first service provider that, that came to us. Uh, we want to understand, as others have suggested, some of the other technologies, some of the other delivery means, um, other processes that are available to us. So I think it, it, because of all those things, I, I would have um, misgivings about going forward at this point. And, and echo again what I said earlier, if, if, if we're viable now, then I, I certainly have to assume we're going to be viable after this is, is up and running someplace else and, 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 and as still as desirable. So thank you. Thank you. Mr. Peterson, Mr. Hales, I think, uh, have you gotten the information you needed on this tonight? Yes, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. We do have um, um, comments um, and questions by the general public. Um, we did push this to the end of the meeting because we knew there were going to be a lot of issues that came up um, that uh, might influence your, your question or your line of questioning. So at this time, uh, can I just see a, uh, a show of hands of people who would like to speak? Okay. Got three people that would like to speak. And uh, usual rules, uh, we'd ask you to come forward, state your name and address for the record, uh, keep your comments to three minutes or so, and um, we'll start with this gentleman right here. Have it, can everybody hear me? No, I need you at the seat, sir. My name is Mike Pulowski. I'm a resident of Fairbury, which is very close by here. And uh, in about three minutes, I can give you folks the education on gasification and synthetic development that you probably should have gotten maybe three years ago. First of all, the process that this is built on is absolutely 100% sound science. As Alan mentioned, uh, gasification has been around since the Dead Sea was just getting sick, okay? And what you can imagine a uh, gasifier is, is it's a landfill on steroids. What it takes the landfill months and years to accomplish, these people can accomplish in a matter of minutes. They thermochemically degrade that waste into its core molecular structures, which can then be utilized much like the petrochemical industry does as building blocks for new technology. And if you think this technology does not exist, then you haven't been watching television when Castrol tells you that their new synthetic motor oil is made from natural gas. That's the same type of process that Paradigm Bioaviation is planning to use to develop jet fuel. The products are on the shelf already. You, it might not be jet fuel today because the major barrier to, to jet fuel from biomass and municipal solid waste is the cleaning of that gas so that you get rid of the nasty portions and it doesn't cost you an arm and a leg to do so. Okay, the second point here is your garbage is not a natural resource, it is not an asset. It is a liability to you folks. It's a liability to your citizens. And to give them no clear picture as far as the cost of what their disposal costs are gonna be five and 10 years from now is irresponsible. You're not providing a clear picture of what the costs are. Paradigm Bioaviation can do that for you. Okay, and the, the last point I'd like to make is reputation in these businesses is everything. And if the reputation of your communities gets out there into the development market in such a manner as which, yep, they'll lead you down a rosy path for three years and they'll pull the rug right out from underneath you, you won't be second, you won't be third, you won't be fifth, you won't be anything but last because you cannot turn people away after such a long period of time. The time to say no in a process like this was about two
two years ago. If you didn't have the stomach for it, the time to tell them you didn't have the stomach for it was two years ago before they wasted millions of dollars and you wasted an enormous amount of your own community's resources to lead people down a path and you didn't take the time to educate yourself on what everything was all about. There should be no questions about whether the technology is sound. Everyone should have a comfortable feeling with that. I hope, I, and I may have taken a little more time, but, you know, I'm a, I'm a chemical engineer by education. I'm a business development manager for gasification products. And I can tell you, as sure as I'm sitting here, that the technology is sound. The risk is doing nothing. Thank you. Mr. Franklin. <clears throat> My name is Alton Franklin. I live at 508 Patterson Drive here uh, in Bloomington. I find myself in a rather unique position tonight, that being one of uh, applauding what I've heard tonight. I heard genuine discussion. I heard absolutely great deliberation. Uh, it's uh, refreshingly unique. Uh, with regard to uh, Anything that's uh, tied to the technology, yes, it's restructuring molecules. We, we've got all kinds of catalyzers that are out there. Simple fact is, is, is it right for our community? I agree that I want to see more green stuff because uh, to me, my kids, grandkids, great grandkids on down the line are the single most important thing to me. That's what, that's what drives everything that I do, especially my relation with the uh, municipal government. With regards to this, uh, I'll say what I really feel like uh, there's a lot of the council members felt, but were polite enough not to say, and that's, I just don't trust somebody that keeps on changing their story. I don't trust somebody that tells me, oh, well, yeah, we said that, we don't really mean that. I don't trust somebody that tells me, oh, well, we can do this kind of business finagling and put ourselves in a position to charge off a lot of our expenses to a nonprofit, but we'll still make much of the money. That sort of stuff just leaves me feeling greasy. And I, again, applaud you for the ration that you brought, the sanity with which you dealt it, and, and what I believe was the greatest decision that I've seen come out of a body. Thank you very much. And the gentleman here, yes. My name is Gary Lambert. I live on 3018 East Oakland in Bloomington. We constantly hear from the Bloomington Council how overworked everyone is. And as has been very obvious tonight, it's easy to see why. There's been a tremendous amount of time expended on this. Obviously, from the questions that have been asked, the council as a whole didn't have a good understanding of this process. We had a council member last night try to ask a question about this meeting, and she was advised that that was out of order, that she couldn't ask that question. There's too much time spent on things done in secrecy, outside of the line of sight of the citizens, and as Alton said, I applaud your questioning, I don't know if it's a good project or not, but at least I'm glad to see you asking the questions. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Galbraith. My name is Rick Galbraith. you even brought your own timer. I did, yes. <laughs> Uh, won't be long. Uh, my name is Rick Galbraith. I live at Three Mallard Court in Bloomington. Uh, I, I do need to ask one question of, of Mr. Robinson. What percentage of uh, bioaviation does he currently own? Do you know, Rob? Um, what percentage of it do I own? Yes, uh-huh. 
Um, I'm sure I can give you an answer to that. It's less than 50%. It's owned by a series of investors of which, you know, I have been a major investor in it because I've usually put these projects together. Um, it's, I mean, I don't own 100% of it, that's for sure. It's, I think it's less than 50%. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Uh, I, I think it was very interesting that the first commenter uh, said that reputation is everything. Uh, I, I am in possession of a, approximately a 150-page document which represents itself to be uh, from uh, an English court wherein uh, Mr. Robinson was fined, I think it was $12 million outside the corporate uh, veil of his organization. And he was characterized by that a judge in, I think, 2008, please correct me if I'm wrong, as a very dishonest person. Whether or not the technology is solid or not, whether or not this is the time and this is the opportunity makes no difference to me. I'm looking at the people who I would do business with, and clearly, this isn't someone that I would value. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before we adjourn, Mr. Vizzini, Mr. Robertson. Robinson, if you have comments on I think just to answer um, several points that was brought up by the councillors there, why Bloomington Normal right now? The answer is your landfill is closing and you have a requirement to do something with the waste that doesn't displace an, an incumbent landfill owner. Um, that is not a usual situation and you know, it was actually going to close in 2014, which was why we started this project some time ago. Um, I have been dealing with Limited Normal since 1999 when I first brought an aircraft there. Um, there are people in your audience there that I've known for more than 10 years um, who, answering the gentleman that um, just brought up the corporate issue that went on, I was not fined. I was found jointly and separately liable for uh, litigation costs against an, uh, an accountancy firm who admitted negligence and overcharged and the court found that they did overcharge but we spent 20 million dollars in litigation and the judge had to find some reason for justifying what went on never did hear 26 witness statements or anything else but you know if you want to attack my reputation um, you know there's very little I can do about that um, in terms of the rate you know, could you get a lesser rate and did we just stick a finger in the air to end up at $50? No, we have spent a year and a half just in terms of the modeling of this and it's quite sensitive to the feedstock input, input to it. So that rate, which is not just for you, it's for, you know, the entire uh, 600 tons that comes in the door, um, does need a tipping rate or else the economics of the thing don't work and don't stack up. Um, as far as the team and whether or not we are competent to do this, Michael, um, who is on this call, you know, ran all of Laporte's uh, chemical plants around the world. We have other parties here that are designing this plant that are, you know, Titec that are involved in all of this. We have partners that are dealing with gasification. And quite frankly, we would not be well respected within the financial community um, if they did not think that we were capable of building a project like this. A $130 million bond is not easy to come by and I think if you ask in the industry you will find that we are thought quite highly in terms of our knowledge and our understanding of um, what is involved here. And then lastly, the lady that brought up the three types of um, ASTM standards, this Fisher Trophy or SPK uh, alternative fuel is the process we're dealing and it was the very first of those uh, three, now four, different approaches to producing synthetic fuels. So I think there's a little misunderstanding there. And then lastly, you know, I'm quite happy to, to find the paperwork that I gave to Mr. Uh, Peterson um, with this structure. Um, I'm sure it's dated, but it is about three months ago that I gave him a sheet on this. So this is not us changing opinion on it. And as far as um, do we need 20 years? Yes, we need 20 years. Are we changing an opinion on it? Um, you know, you asked, was there a way to look at the language on the reopener on it? And I think um, George Muller said yes, he was quite willing to look at the language. I don't think anybody said 
oh no, five years is okay at all. That's not what was ever said in this meeting, unless I misunderstood it. Certainly I did not say that. 20 years is what the financial people will look to. Um, and I think the gentleman that started this, you know, we've gone a long way down this route with you for a number of years, and it would have, you know, my concern was always that the community would react at this late stage, having spent a lot of money um, in this process. And, you know, he's right. I don't think you'll find anybody else that will turn up in Bloomington now when, you know, you cause people to spend this much money and come with this opinion so late in the day. It is your prerogative, um, and I'm not in any way, unless that's the, the way you want to approach it, it would have been nice to have known this um, some time ago. You know, um, and you know, clearly it is not going to work in Bloomington. Um, and I wish you well that you find some method to deal with your waste when your landfill closes that is economic for you. I suspect that you're going to pay quite a premium to have it trucked down to Clinton or up to P Pontiac as the two options. But you know, that is your prerogative. So. Robert, is there anything you want to say? Yeah, actually there is. Uh, uh, later, a day or two from now, uh, Mark, I'd like to sit with you. <laughs> uh, not today and not tomorrow. Uh, but I think uh, we need to have a little chat. Uh, the, the reason I left retirement in February is because I believed in this project. I believed in Alan Robinson. I believed in George Miller, uh, a, an accomplished attorney in this field, and I, like George, wanted to have my name attached to something that this community could do, be first, and attract people from all over the country. Uh, it's not going to happen. We'll get on to something else. I appreciate all the work that's been done. I don't want to leave with any hard feelings. Uh, let's. Uh, Let's part and part friends and try to do something else that can benefit the community. We're good. Thank you very much. Unless there's other comments, uh, we're not formal here, so we'll adjourn unless somebody would like to continue. We are adjourned. Thank you. Um, Alan, I'd like to make one or two comments. You, you might want to hang up the telephone. <laughs> I, uh, I don't know what's going to be said next. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I'd like to make one or two comments. No. So, somebody hang up that phone, please.